from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to all of you for day two of our second annual Astrobiology Symposium here at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. And we appreciate your patience with us this morning. I'm glad to see so many of you with your cups of coffee in hand. And uh, we have another full day, so I know that it's important to have that cup of coffee to start in the morning. So my name is Jason Steinhauer, and I'm a program specialist here at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the entire Kluge Center, on behalf of the library, it's my, my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the library this morning. And uh, to all of you who are watching on the live stream, uh, welcome into the Library of Congress as well, and we're glad that you're watching with us. Uh, before today's program begins, uh, we'll just ask you to please check your cell phones and ensure that they are set to either silent or vibrate. And also, it's our duty to let you know that we are filming this program for future broadcasts on the Library of Congress and Kluge Center websites, as well as on our YouTube and iTunes channels. And in addition, we are live streaming today, and our thanks to the NASA Astrobiology Institute for their help in enabling this live stream, and we welcome all of our viewers uh, from around the world. We are also, uh, as yesterday, we are also tweeting this symposium. The uh, hashtag is prepare to discover, and the Kluge Center's Twitter handle is at Kluge Center, K-L-U-G-E-C-T-R. So we hope that you'll share your insights, not only in person here in the room through question and answer, but also on the internet through Twitter and the chat on the live stream as well. I want to take a quick minute to just introduce the Kluge Center again to those of you who may not have been here with us yesterday and to those who are watching online today. The John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress is a vibrant scholar center here on Capitol Hill that invites and welcomes scholars from around the world to the Library of Congress to conduct research in the Library of Congress collections. We have 12 senior chair positions for distinguished senior scholars, and we have numerous fellowship opportunities for uh, postdoctoral uh, fellows as well as for doctoral candidates. And if you're interested in learning more about the Kluge Center, I invite you to visit our website, loc.gov slash Kluge, also to sign up for email alerts to learn about uh, future events. And if you're interested in conducting your own research here at the Library of Congress, uh, I encourage you to look at the various fellowship opportunities that we have available through the Kluge Center. Um, I'd also like to make mention of the NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology, which is the impetus for this event. This is a relatively new and unique collaboration between two agencies, the NASA Astrobiology Program and the Library of Congress John W. Kluge Center, uh, to enable one senior scholar to be in residence at the Library of Congress for up to a year to conduct research on astrobiology's humanistic and societal implications, what it means for humanity and society, that we are uncovering so much about the origins of life, the future of life, and the conditions for life, both on Earth and in the cosmos. So that is what uh, our current chairholder, uh, Stephen Dick, has been conducting his research on here at the Library of Congress all year, and is the impetus for bringing together all these great scholars from around the world to discuss the issue at length. Um, we are actually currently seeking uh, our next astrobiology chair, and the application process uh, for that is currently ongoing, and there's a deadline of December 1st for application. So if you or a colleague are interested in being the next NASA Library of Congress chair in astrobiology, I encourage you to visit our website to learn more, and we'll be happy to answer any questions about the chair position. Speaking of the chair position, it's now my great privilege to uh, once again uh, welcome Dr. Stephen Dick to the stage. Uh, my colleague Dan Torello gave a wonderful introduction to Stephen yesterday, and uh, as, as mentioned, Stephen's uh, CV would extend for many pages and probably fill up uh, 
all of the entirety of your program booklet today if we were to write it in its entirety. Uh, but he's the author of 19 books. He's a, uh, a recognized and distinguished historian of science and astronomer. He was the former chief historian at NASA. And we've been very privileged to have him here as the uh, for second, excuse me, second uh, Baroque S. Blumberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. And this uh, conference, this two-day symposium, is really the result of his hard work um, and his dedication and his passion for the subject of astrobiology and what its implications are for humanity and society. And he's done wonderful research in the Library of Congress collections with numerous different materials that we have to help illuminate and help us understand this very challenging question. So please join me in welcoming again to the stage, uh, Dr. Stephen Dick. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, welcome to all of you to uh, day two of our symposium, Preparing for a Discovery, uh, a rational approach to uh, the impact of finding microbial complex and intelligent life beyond the Earth. Um, for those of you, I know not all of you were here yesterday, so I just wanted to uh, go over a few of the uh, ideas uh, that I had by way of introduction yesterday. Uh, remind you, as Jason said, that this is not your normal astrobiology technical meeting. This is a meeting about the humanistic aspects of astrobiology, where we're looking at the uh, societal impact uh, if we do find life in whatever form. Um, and we're uh, inspired to do this because of, uh, if you were here yesterday, you heard about some of these things um, uh, from both uh, Chairman uh, Lamar Smith, who's the chair of the House Science Committee, and from Mary Wojtek, uh, the head of astrobiology over at NASA, about the, how uh, robust astrobiology is these days as a discipline. It used to be called a science without a subject. I, I don't think you can really say that anymore. Uh, because uh, at the uh, Astrobiology Science Conference meetings that we have, we'll have another one in Chicago in June. Uh, upwards of uh, five, six, seven hundred people come now from all variety of disciplines, including not only the natural sciences, but also the so social sciences. So we now have a lot of science going on, as you see here, uh, most spectacularly in, in many people's opinion, uh, are these discoveries of thousands of planets beyond the solar system. Uh, some of them Earth-sized, uh, we don't yet know if they're habitable, but uh, we're starting to look for biosignatures on those. And then also as well in the solar system where we used to think there was just Mars that might be habitable, we have all these other possible habitats now outside of what uh, the habitable zone used to be thought to be uh, at a certain distance from the sun, but even out in the uh, giant planets uh, orbits uh, of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. We have these satellites that may have uh, oceans. Pretty sure they do have oceans. The question is, is there life there? Because where there's water, there could be, uh, there could be life. And then the uh, extremophiles on Earth that we find in all these uh, different uh, conditions under radiation, temperatures, pressures, um, uh, hydrothermal vents deep down below the ocean, eight to 10,000 feet. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, thing that a lot of people have heard about also, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, with, which uh, Seth uh, uh, talked about yesterday, which is uh, very exciting if we actually would get some kind of a signal from, uh, from a planet orbiting one of those uh, planets that we now know exist out there. And uh, was, as was said yesterday, there are maybe a thousand or so planets that have been discovered, but this is just one tiny sliver of the sky. We now think that uh, most stars have planets, and even the as, as Seth said yesterday, even these red dwarfs, which are 70, 75 percent of all stars, these tiny, star, uh, these tiny stars, uh, now are known to have planets and could have habitable zones. So that really increases the, the possibilities. So that's why we feel that it's necessary to start to discuss what the impact might be if we find life in, in any form. So, um, and I think in general it's a good idea to uh, talk about uh, societal impact of science and technology because, after all, science and technology are both drivers of uh, society, I think. And uh, we need to look at societal implications of what science is doing, uh, and that's what is done with the Human Genome Project, for example, and, and many other uh, things. So I think we try, need to try and anticipate the problems um, so uh, that maybe we can uh, uh, have a more positive outcome down the, down the line. So yesterday we talked about uh, frameworks uh, for approaching the problems of discovery 
and uh, impact, including history, discovery, analogy, worldviews, that sort of thing. Uh, we also uh, discussed, I think the discussions were very interesting and uh, contentious in some ways yesterday about, about uh, um, how to uh, transcend anthropocentrism with concepts uh, like uh, life and intelligence, culture and civilization. Uh, we didn't hear uh, much about communication yesterday because Doug Vakach was not, not able to make it. He was supposed to talk about communication. Uh, I'll just say I think that's a crucial aspect because I think it's not at all, I'm not at all sanguine about being able to communicate with extraterrestrial intelligence if we, if we ever find it because uh, they would have evolved under their own conditions and maybe different um, perceptual realities and that sort of thing. So, uh, but that's again where analogies come in where you may have to do decipherment and that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, uh, today we're going to do something quite different. Yesterday we laid the foundations um, and today we're going to uh, tackle the actual potential philosophical and religious and cultural and practical impacts uh, if we find uh, extraterrestrial life. And again, we'll be asking uh, questions that are uh, fundamental and go to the roots of some of our uh, most cherished concepts. And I should say that uh, we are aware that uh, our approach has been uh, rather Western-centric. Uh, and I'm very pleased to announce that uh, Cambridge University Press has just agreed to publish the results of this, uh, the papers that will come from this meeting, um, and not only publish uh, a volume on this, but also publish it as a trade volume, which means you have some chance of being able to afford actually buying the book. Uh, but the other point is that uh, we are going to be able to expand uh, to some of the non-Western uh, aspects in that volume, uh, especially in the religious uh, aspects. Uh, so we didn't have room on the program today for all of that, but we will have room in the book, which should be out sometime next year. So uh, again, uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, the Kluge Center uh, and NASA for co-sponsoring this. Um, as, J as Jason said, the Kluge Center has been a fabulous place to do research. I recommend it to, uh, to all of you and the Library of Congress in general. If you haven't been up to see the exhibits, uh, it's just a fabulous place. Um, and so uh, please do that if you have the time. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's see, we want to uh, start the session uh, this morning. And I would ask the, uh, we have uh, six speakers in this session. So if the speakers would come up here and uh, the moderator, Con uh, Con Connie Bertka is going to have to <laughs> wait until uh, afterwards when we actually have the panel discussion because we only have room for six chairs here. Uh, but she's here waiting anxiously to, uh, to moderate when we, we finish here. And um, so I think I'll call uh, Mark up for his remarks. Uh, Mark Lupicella, this is uh, the other half of the Dick and Lupicella book, Cosmos and Culture, which if you haven't seen it, it's all online. You can buy it or it's all online at the NASA History Office. For free, yes, for free. So Mark, take it away. Okay, uh, so because yesterday's conversation was not wide-ranging and speculative enough, uh, we're gonna go cosmic, and we're gonna blame Steve Dick for that. Uh, it's kind of his idea. Um, this is really actually gonna be a talk mostly about values. Um, so since this is Friday morning, and I, the advantage of, I guess, talking first is, Maybe you can go longer than 20 minutes. I don't know if that's true or not, but the disadvantage is you gotta wake everybody up. So let's, let's play the, actually I should ask, can I play a video from the internet? Is that uh, a clip? Is that, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and play this to wake folks up. This is about values. You know, I always hear that the moon landing was the last great thing that America did. I think the last great thing America did was giving health care to 30 million people. I, 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 I I find that to be so much more of a significant achievement than landing on the moon. Really? Yeah, I really do. Oh, so is that a question or... or, or I'm just maybe? throwing that out. Just, Which do you think is a fight. greater achievement? I do. I want to fight. <laughs> do I get to lead off on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Please, please. So, I'd like to comment that people who go to the moon come from a community of people who want to explore where we've never been before. Not only places, but ideas. And that frontier, especially when it's in the sciences, 
arrives at discoveries, some of which have transformed medicine. In fact, you go into a hospital, every machine with an on-off switch brought into the service of diagnosing the condition of the human body is based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine because they had the freedom to explore the frontier. So to say, to, to pit one against the other, oh, as help. though you can even have health care okay. in the absence of these machines. Okay, so of course none of that is meant to be advocacy. That is just an illustration of what happens when people have fairly different values. Right? These are two fairly similar people, actually, and they're at obvious conflict. Not, not I shouldn't say obvious conflict, but, but there's a definite disagreement about values, to the point where they were maybe even slightly talking past each other, which, which Neil deGrasse Tyson was sort of pointing out. So I happened to be watching that while I was preparing this, uh, this talk. So I was like, okay, that's a cosmic coincidence. I got to play that for folks, and we didn't have coffee this morning, so I sacrificed the, uh, the, the hour or the uh, minute and a half for that. Um, so I'll just kind of jump in. Here, here's sort of where I want to try to go. We're going to ask, you know, really, are we going to seriously talk about future roles and implications of the life on a cosmic scale. Say a little bit about life, and then drill down a little bit on intelligence. Um, you know, talk just very briefly about culture, get into value theory, uh, that's just a little bit. Talk a little bit about normative aspiration, is something that I think is probably central to this, this presentation. Touch a little bit on uh, facts, values, is, ought. I think that's an, it is an interesting question. It's got an interesting philosophical history, and I think it might be more relevant to conversations like this than it is to other conversations. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Maybe if I have time, we'll talk about cosmocultural evolution, and then try to say a few things about what this has to do for preparing for discovery. So seriously, uh, you know, this is kind of the ultimate cosmic hubris sort of thing, right? We're, you know, are we humans really in a position to begin to say credible things about this long-term future? Um, and then the normative question, should we even engage in things like that? And so the, the answer is, well, yes, kind of, sort of. Um, it may be more relevant than it first appears. So presentations like this might help bring that out. A lot of these conversations, I think, bring it out. It may be a helpful way to understand ourselves. We've heard that a couple of times. Lenses, different scenarios, different ways of thinking about our own nature, our own future, our own values, what we desire. And of course, we need to watch out for grand romantic ideologies and worldviews that, that we all know can be very problematic. And of course, there is precedent. People have engaged in this kind of thing, some in this very room. Um, Sci-fi, I think, is a very rich history of trying to think about very long-term, cosmic scale oriented um, visions for humans and other beings as well. And maybe if nothing else, it's fun for some people, not as fun for others maybe. Um, I think for a lot of people here, it's pretty fun. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's serious enough. So I just did want to throw this up partly because I love this, this book cover. And uh, since you put the book up before, I said, ah, okay, we're gonna, I'll put this up. Um, uh, this was a recent attempt to get into these sort of cosmic perspectives about the human condition. It's not just about how how what we've learned about the universe informs culture. It's also about what culture may mean for the universe, possibly, sort of the, the reverse. Um, and, and probably a third of the book is devoted more or less to that kind of question. And there's some pretty provocative chapters in there. Paul Davies, in particular, um, wrote a pretty provocative article. OK, so life can be highly capable and intelligent without um, uh, oh, excuse me, with apparently with having highly variable degrees of awareness and consciousness. So I think we heard a little bit about this um, yesterday. So highly capable, highly intelligent. That, that doesn't mean that the beings are necessarily highly aware. That's a, an open question. Um, but it does appear that there can be a lot of intelligence and a lot of capability without a lot of awareness. Darwinian evolution is arguably blindly, voraciously single-minded. Um, I sometimes like to think of it as filtered replication. Maybe nothing more than that. That's a minimalist view of it. Um, but it is pretty blind, and it is pretty uh, single-minded. But arguably, uh, certain kinds of intelligence are changing this. So regarding intelligence, um, that is also arguably very single-minded. Right? It's all in pursuit of genetic replicative ends, arguably, at least, again, in, in more the minimal, minimalist view of it. 
But human intelligence seems to be um, exhibiting highly complex, highly aware, possibly non-Darwinian behaviors. And even if we're not getting there, it does look like human beings have a certain potential to move beyond Darwinian evolution. I think there are lots of examples. Some of them, maybe a lot of them are illusions of sorts, but it does appear that humans uh, and our culture have a tremendous potential to, do, uh, to move a little bit beyond Darwinian evolution. And it's culture that, that does that. So on to culture then. Much, much culture is arguably shaped by evolution, evolutionary psychology in particular, including social psychology and group selection. I think group selection is a, a really important concept for understanding how human minds have been designed and developed. It's a little bit controversial, but I think more and more scientists are coming around to the idea that group selection is a dynamic, is a force, and it has tremendous explanatory power. Culture contemplates, it aspires, it, it changes, and that changes its own important, its own important uh, complex, open-ended dynamic. And as I mentioned before, it does look like cultural change is moving beyond Darwinian evolution, or biological evolution. So value theory, to me, is actually a fairly compelling example of human culture that I think is worth spending uh, a couple of minutes on. So what is valuable? How valuable is it? What does and should influence what is valued? So these are just some areas of value theory, ethics, meta-ethics, aesthetics. There are others. But normative aspiration seems to be, perhaps, unique to humans. Every time someone makes a claim about what's unique to humans, someone comes along and says, well, here's an example of... But, but the fact that we contemplate norms, that we debate those norms, that we imagine, that we run these simulations in our head, that we make some choices about what we think might be better versus something else, um, whether you think that's a good activity or not, it does at least appear as though humans engage in this to a remarkable extent. Um, and it may be particularly important when we start thinking about uh, longer term trends. So I've already sort of mentioned what, what normative aspiration basically does, contemplates and pursues what is valued. It's highly influenced by Darwinian evolution, so we don't want to hold this up as something that's somehow transcendent necessarily, but again, maybe the potential is there. It can obviously drive us crazy, literally does drive some people crazy. Um, a key issue for normative aspiration is this fact-value interplay. Uh, how, how does so-called facts of the world, what we often think of as independent physical reality that are testable, that are empirical, how do they relate to values? There's a long history and tradition thinking about this question. We might say that, uh, I have to give the obligatory statement about this is the only equation in the uh, presentation, but it's not even an equation. But normative aspiration probably just equals something like adding up our facts, adding up our values, which is a lot. Um, maybe it leads to, to wisdom. Maybe it's ultimately something like what complete reality is. Um, so maybe homo sapiens, sapiens being wise, the word for wise, Latin for wise, isn't too far off. Maybe we are uniquely in pursuit of wisdom where other animals, at least on Earth so far as we know, are not. So, so we at least make this attempt. It doesn't mean we get there, but we at least try. We're, we're at least homo normativus aspirationists, something crazy like that. Um, okay, so this was that quote, so I can skip through that. This, was, this came from the Bill Maher and, and Tyson uh, interchange, again, to try to illustrate how very different people can think about values. Similar human beings on a program with a similar worldviews in a lot of ways, actually, and yet they had these, this quite dramatic uh, disagreement. So there are many nuances for how to think about facts and values, uh, and sci-fi helps us do that. I think sci-fi, science fiction is a, is a great way to, to learn more about this interplay, science being more on the facts and empirical side of it, and fiction being more on the values and, um, and exploring that side of it. Um, but I really just want to make the point here that not that they're necessarily so dramatically different, but just that they're different enough to make a difference for the purpose of contemplating the long-term future. So I do think that the distinction has been overemphasized and over, uh, oversimplified philosophically for, for a long time, but I do think it is a distinction worth noting. Um, facts can certainly inform, probably should inform our values, but don't necessarily determine or constrain values. And the facts of evolutionary selection forces resulting and resulting designs of brains are facts that heavily influence many, if not most, or all of our values. 
but that doesn't mean they're necessarily the same thing when we think out into the future. So we have to be careful about facts and science and empirical pursuits under determining our values, under determining that to which we aspire, the norms to which we aspire. So facts primarily occupy an empirical space and values occupy a logical possibility space. So I think I can skip through a bunch of this because I kind of covered this. Um, the fact that, that facts influence value, the middle bullet here, is I think something everybody more or less acknowledges and more or less agrees. This happens all the time. Um, but we don't necessarily say that what we learn empirically about the world is what drives the ought, what drives the value, what drives the normative aspiration. And that goes all the way back to, to David Hume and probably others that tried to make this point, to be a little bit careful about moving so easily from facts into values. So the, the, the big challenge seems to be figuring out what to do with our knowledge. And that knowledge is going to continue to increase. We're going to continue to become much more capable. And as that happens, presumably, our ability to value things, the details of what we value, will massively transcend what we understand the world to be, at least in principle. I think we're seeing some examples of that today, actually. So really, then, assessing the ought is, becomes a matter of a certain kind of open-ended reasoning about values, different than the pursuits of science to some uh, notable extent. And I mentioned science fiction. OK. So um, I do have a bunch of charts here to kind of just go through some of this stuff. I'm going to go through these just kind of quickly to give a graphical representation maybe of one, one way of thinking about facts and values. So they could be separate and distinct. This is a fairly traditional view. There could be some overlap. There could be very significant overlap. Maybe there's essentially complete overlap so that there is no distinction. Maybe facts subsume values. I think it's possible that Sam Harris, I don't know if people are familiar with Sam Harris' work in the moral landscape, but he seems to be wanting to head in this direction that facts really do ultimately determine what, what values are. Something very close to that. Um, but I think then it gets interesting when we start to think about there might be a lot of overlap, but as we become more capable, presumably our values start to be much larger. The logical possibility space of values presumably gets much larger than what we know about the world, so that values far exceed facts. Maybe there's a, you know, there's a little bit of, of facts that are pure facts on their own that are not necessarily related to values. Um, but then our ability to realize these values gets better and better. Maybe at some point we are effectively consuming or subsuming our facts with values. Um, now, these are beings, of course, that have tremendous power over the physical world. They have a lot, of, uh, a lot of capabilities. So this is just a speculation about how the evolution, if I could, of values and facts may go over time. The more capable a species, the more aware, perhaps, um, the more values become a significant driver of what actually physically happens in their world. So facts may constrain beings forever. They may, uh, beings may ultimately choose to be constrained by facts for a lot of reasons. Um, or we may, or beings may choose to have our values go well beyond facts. And here are just some quick thoughts about why beings might choose to be constrained by facts. It's not a good idea to try to mess with the physical world, like, say, Darwinian evolution or certain kinds of environmental states. Maybe we just need to leave things alone. Uh, maybe it's undesirable for other philosophical reasons. But if we, if we or other future beings decide to really kind of take a certain amount of control with our values leading the way, then I think we've got an infinite possibility space. And I, I think that's where it gets interesting regarding ETI, because how do, you, how do we deal with that? How do we navigate what might be an infinite possibility space of values for ourselves and for other beings? OK, I think I, I will probably skip this, because I don't want to exceed time. Am I, is someone keeping track of time, by the way? Maybe five minutes? Five, yeah. OK, um, I might just come back to that. But this is just the basic idea that, that as beings become more capable, maybe we co-evolve with the universe, and that cultural beings become significant, in some sense, for the universe. Now, here's 
this is where I start to really get in trouble, of course. Here, here's an example of a way of thinking about our significance or the significance of cultural beings, ultimately. Maybe, you know, everyone's got to have these scales, and yes, these scales always get people in trouble. We don't want to be too uh, beholden to things like this. But just as an example, you know, type one influence for being like, uh, beings like us, other similar beings, planetary. Maybe then it's astrophysical, literally, the ability to do things on astrophysical scales. Others have suggested this. Um, maybe at some point we become cosmological. There are people literally talking about possibly creating universes. Alan Guth has said, well, I don't really know that it can be done yet, but we've got some analysis and maybe there's a possibility. Sounds kind of crazy. Uh, maybe it will turn out to be crazy, but it, this is in the minds of human beings. So it's worth making note just, I think, because of that. Um, ontological, I, I guess I probably will just skip that for now. And then, you know, maybe there is ultimately a kind of metaphysical significance or a kind of metaphysical consequence for cultural beings. I'm not sure I could say a lot about that. Others on the panel may. Um, so I thought I would, I'd leave that in there. And that's sort of in there for the sake of completeness. You know, one doesn't want to be dismissive of things metaphysical. Um, I, think it's, I think it's worth, worth keeping in there. So, you know, maybe we do become homo cosmicus or something like that, and other beings are doing very similar things. Okay, so some deep thoughts from Mork and Mindy in the, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, remember the late, great uh, Robin Williams. Mork, if Holly liked him so much, how come she punched him and told him he was weird? Mindy, boys and girls often punch or push or hit each other as a sign of affection. Punching and pushing and calling someone names means you like them? Yeah, it can. Mork, then the cowboys and Indians are lovers? So, and I think Steve might have had the, 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 the Indian analogy up yesterday, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, this is just obviously a very simple way of representing the idea that um, it's very confusing to look at human behavior. It's very confusing uh, to know how to interpret um, if you're looking in from the outside and even when you're looking from the inside. So Bill Maher said uh, to, to Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think it was the same episode, so sorry for putting it in here, but, um, and this quote may not be exactly right by Ken Ham, but it is the exact quote from Bill Maher, saying, Ken Ham said we should call off the search for extraterrestrial life because aliens haven't heard the word of Jesus and thus are going to hell anyway. And Tyson said, that's messed up. <laughs> um, and and you should, I actually have the video clip there. That's also very funny. You should see his face. It's, it's quite nice. Um, but again, only meant to illustrate uh, a radically different way of thinking about things with human beings on our planet, our own species, massive diversity. Uh, I will skip this. Um, this was a continuation <laughs> of Tyson basically saying, yeah, life is random. Um, you know, get over it, because Bill Maher is pointing out people don't tolerate that idea that life may have very random components. And uh, so this is the way uh, Tyson ends it. Of course, life is not, strictly speaking, random, um, but it has random components and things that are highly contingent. Okay, so I'll just run through these real, real quick then. Uh, this is just a very loose connection of some of this philosophy, it's not exactly philosophy, but some of these thoughts to, to some more practical implications. So, so we should be mindful of the fact that highly capable life without normative aspiration could be dangerous, right? That is something to just be, I think, mindful of, careful of. Under normative aspiration, um, it may be an important pursuit for ETI, especially in light of natural selection. They may look at that mechanism and have a lot to say about it. They may dismiss it altogether, may completely undo it, may choose to stay with it. That's sort of like staying with the facts versus not. Um, normative aspiration in light of cosmic evolution may be something that ETI pursues, partly because the universe is a nice, maybe a nice frame of reference for other intelligent beings in the universe. Normative aspiration can also be very dangerous, of course, endless examples of that. Uh, ETI may look for better normative aspiration from humanity. This came up, I think, yesterday. Someone raised the point, well, maybe ETI is looking at human beings and thinking, uh, not yet. Our ethical posture towards non-intelligent life could be informed by cosmic perspectives, cosmic evolution. There's been some writing on that. We may not have objective answers from anybody ever. ETI may not have it, or they may. If they do, what does that look like? These are all scenarios that I think are probably worth developing and thinking through 
a little bit if we had an entity uh, that could devote a lot of time to this kind of thing. As I think Seth was asking yesterday, should we have somebody that does more of this? Do we, do we get trapped in a selfishness trap ultimately? Does ETI ultimately get trapped in a selfishness trap? There is no winding your way out of that for a variety of reasons. That may be a, a scenario. Machines may turn out to be more objective, perhaps. Maybe they're programmed that way, or there's some way in which they achieve a more objective uh, fairness and, and equity. Uh, caring capacity maybe goes up as the cost of caring goes down, making normative aspiration easier, perhaps. I think we see a lot of evidence of that. Um, a post-intelligent universe may render intelligence much less, much less important than values. And then that last question was, you know, so is this cosmic humility? Is this cosmic hubris? Is it something in between? Um, is, it, is it problematic for, for lots of other reasons? So understanding human rationality and irrationality would be really, really helpful. Um, will we see ourselves in a, a cosmic dance or a cosmic fight or both? Should we look out for large-scale physical modifications of the universe? perhaps astrophysical scales. And then on the subject of diversity, this is the last slide. Um, I think the way we see diversity relates to a lot of what, what came prior. And evolution produced this remarkable diversity of life and mind in a very open-ended way. Um, th this suggests, I think we heard some of this yesterday, the need for much more comparative psychology, including non-human animals. We heard about that yesterday. And then values could be extremely, extremely diverse, shockingly diverse, sort of mind-blowingly diverse, incomprehensibly diverse. And uh, it raises the question, how, how, if at all, do we cope with that enormous value space, that logical possibility space that exists and that may be instantiated by ourselves to some extent and, and uh, other beings? And we can do a lot of these tests here on Earth. People are kind of working on that a little bit. We do have a tremendous variety here on Earth. We saw two men from the same culture having pretty notable disagreement about what's valuable or what's more valuable, I should say, um, and not even exactly agreeing on how to talk about values, right? Just very different mindset from two very similar people. So we've got a lot of variety, a lot of diversity here on Earth that uh, would allow us to be prepared. And then I'll just leave you with this thought that add to all this diversity, the diversity of universes. If there is a multiverse out there, then I guess all these infinities get multiplied by infinities and it really becomes uh, uh, mind boggling. So, all right, well, I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, there are two of us presenting this, and I'm presenting part one, and I think I speak for us both um, when I say that we are delighted to be here, and we want to offer our thanks to Stephen Dick for including us in this very important symposium. My co-author, Carol, is a professor of philosophy of science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Now, I'm just finishing my dissertation in political science at the University of Pennsylvania, and given that I believe I'm the only card-carrying political scientist speaking here at this symposium. And my research interests focus on slightly different topics, that is civil rights, the intersection of bioethics and public policy and constitutional law. I wanna, at the outset, say that I'm approaching the topics discussed here at this symposium from a somewhat different perspective. Bluntly, it is my conviction that if we do find extraterrestrial life, then law and public policy will be immensely important on a practical level, and that public policy ought to be informed by ethical considerations. And these ethical considerations we suggest here today are about non-human animals. For what would an alien be? And we're not talking about illegal aliens here. What would an alien be, but by definition, a non-human animal? So with that, let us begin. Um, I will return to that provocative photograph in just a minute. Um, but to give you, you an idea of where we're going, um, I'm delivering part one, and we have two questions. Uh, I'm asking, what if we do find extraterrestrial life? What ethical theories? Um, are we going to rely on? So what moral quandaries might we face? 
How should the theoretical concept of an ethical subject inform our discussion? And finally, we want to suggest that astrobiology is really a new frontier in bioethics. In part two, Carol will be um, asking the question, can we move beyond our anthropocentric conceptions of moral status? And she's the lucky one here because she gets to deal with the exciting examples, um, science fiction thought experiments, and non-human animals on Earth that are weird, I'd like to say, that challenge our anthropocentric ethical assumptions. So uh, with that, let me move on. So this is what we don't want to happen, right, if we have an encounter um, with extraterrestrials. This example comes from the movie District 9. I, I would assume that many of the people in this room have seen it. It's a fantastic movie, so if you haven't, I recommend it. Um, but immediately, we can see um, certain things stand out at us. Besides the fact that human beings are pointing guns at this alien, um, the alien looks very anthropocentric. Right? It's um, got a face. It's uh, bipedal. In fact, it's a humanoid. So even though we recognize it as an alien, um, because it looks weird, it's, it's very humanoid. Moving on, this movie, I think, offers uh, an interesting analogy. And that analogy is the analogy of South African apartheid. So... Um, the sort of uh, hypothesis or premise of this movie is that an alien spacecraft ends up breaking down above jo Johannesburg in 1982. This is, of course, when South African apartheid still existed. So within this political system, which is a political system of racial apartheid, extraterrestrials are incorporated in to the very assumptions of racial apartheid and treated quite similarly. So it's, it's a critique of both racial apartheid and of this idea of how we might treat non-human animals. And I just wanted to begin on sort of that um, provocative note on what we don't want to happen. But this is the background of our talk. And we want to be very open about what facts and what assumptions are influencing the main question that we're asking. So we begin with the fact that all life on Earth shares a common evolutionary origin, which means that we're all very closely related biologically. We heard this yesterday, right? We're actually closely related to microbes. We're closely related, if we're thinking about this in terms of life outside of Earth, we're closely related to fish, to birds, um, we're closely related to Kermit the Frog. So human beings are not very different. Um, uh, we, we all share a common evolutionary ancestor in that sense. Then we have a problem, and that's that N equals one problem. One cannot safely generalize from a single example of life to all life in the universe. Indeed, we have no idea how different life could be from familiar life on Earth if we're looking at other planets, life that evolved um, separately. So this leads us then to our main ethical question. And that is, what should we do if we discover extraterrestrial life? Given the highly Earth-centric character of our current understanding of life, how can we even begin to address the question of our potential ethical responsibilities towards forms of life differing radically from our own. So here I, I want to emphasize um, that science alone cannot, cannot answer this question. This is an ethical question. But it's also a, a question that on the next slide um, I'll, I'll discuss is informed by science. Um, the difference between science and ethics is an important difference to grasp. Ethics is concerned about how things ought to be, specifically about how we ought to behave in certain contexts with questions of right and wrong. 
This contrasts with science, which is the study of facts, both general laws of nature and particular about the world. One cannot logically deduce evaluative ethical conclusions from purely factual premises about the world. And in ethics and public policy, um, we call this the fact value distinction following Mach's favor. So this also extends to public policy. Moving on. Facts, however, are morally significant, and that's an extremely important point. Although ethics reaches beyond purely factual questions about what is and addresses what ought to be, the ethical possibilities that we are willing to entertain when theorizing about morality in applied settings are unavoidably dependent upon what we scientifically know or what we presume to know about the world around us. Specifically, the physical and behavioral char characteristics of a living organism shape the scope and the possible ethical conclusions that we're willing to consider about it. Likewise, ethical theory has the potential to provide science with morally significant normative principles about how scientists and other people ought to act in relation to various organisms. Now, I think a really good example is that of um, comparing a random human being and a random dolphin. Um, so I think most of us would uh, say that it would be immoral, um, unjust, or just simply wrong to take a random human being and dump them without a life vest in the middle of the ocean we might not reach these same ethical conclusions or these same normative conclusions about a random dolphin. And why is that? It's because human beings are terrestrial, whereas dolphins are aquatic. When we find a beached dolphin, we in fact would like to return it to the middle of the ocean. So this means that we really can't think about an animal in isolation of their environment, their physical characteristics, et cetera. Um, so again, facts are morally significant. And the interaction between science and ethics, these two fields, is called bioethics. And this is precisely why we want to argue that astrobiology is a new frontier in bioethics. Um, the inward-outward distinction, I think, is important in the context of this symposium because there are really uh, a couple of prominent ethical questions that broadly are coming up in this, um, in, in this discussion. And one question is an ethical concern that focuses inwardly on humanity vis-a-vis -vis alien life. It asks, what would they mean for us? How would finding an extraterrestrial shape our existential and cultural, perhaps theological, conceptions of ourselves in the universe? Now, that's an important question, but that's not the question that we're focusing on in this paper. We focus in an outward direction on a different ethical quandary. Our concern in this talk is with what sorts of entities are deserving of our moral consideration. What makes an entity the kind of thing that is capable of being wronged by a moral agent such as ourselves? What gives something intrinsic versus extrinsic moral value? And this brings us to the agent-patient distinction. And I think this is particularly important when talking about what we might owe non-human animals, the types of um, ethical theorizing we would apply to non-human beings. We assume, in general, in, in political, um, well, in, in moral philosophy, but also I think intuitively most of us assume that some entities have moral status. This is a general assumption. And moral status tends to come in two different flavors. The first, we have moral agents. Now, moral agents are unimpaired. The sort of prototypical moral agent would be an unimpaired adult human being. They're entities which can distinguish right from wrong and thus may be held responsible for their actions. Now, being held responsible for their actions and distinguishing right from wrong is critical for moral agency. All moral agents are moral patients. Moral patients, however, 
Um, typically, um, in ethical theory, uh, the, the prototypes would be small children or people who are mentally ill, uh, for example. They're entities that deserve our moral consideration. So they deserve consideration by moral agents, but they may not necessarily be held responsible for all their actions. So this brings me to sort of my most important slide in ethical theory. Um, and that is the moral status of non-human uh, organisms. So we have a theoretical problem on our hands, and this has come up many times in this, suppos in this symposium, but the theoretical problem is just as definitions of life tend to be Earth-centric, most ethical theories are anthropocentric. And this includes both traditional secular and theological theories of moral status. Now we're dealing with secular theories of moral status, but it's important to say that it includes both. Um, and there are obvious reasons for this, because ethics was developed as a set of norms and guidelines to shape human behavior. Ethics asks questions of what is wrong or right in society? How should I treat another person? So for instance, most of us in this room, I believe, would think that it would be wrong for somebody to gratuitously torture another person. Likewise, it would be wrong for somebody to get up out of their chair right now and hurt another person without justification. Right? We have these uh, intuitions about how we ought to treat each other, and ethics is trying to spell these out in a logical fashion. Um, but this raises difficulties. So how do we apply it to non-human animals as, how do we look at non-human animals as moral patients when traditional ethics tends to be so anthropocentric? And um, I think the animal rights movement and the ethical theories that have been developed by the philosophers and the biologists that are involved in this movement can be quite useful here. So um, the anthropocentric nature of traditional theories of moral status has recently been challenged and expanded by philosophers, biologists, and theologians associated with the animal rights movement. The two most um, famous that I have up there are Peter Singer and Tom Regan. I won't go into the details of the theories, um, given time constraints, um, but they offer more expansive views of how we might go about doing this um, and thinking about non-human animals as moral patients and deserving our moral consideration. So before turning um, this over to Carol, I just want to end with an important quote by Jeremy Bentham. He was writing in 1781, and he's one of the founders of utilitarian philosophy, um, and he's speaking about his fellow philosophers and past philosophers who have discounted animals, um, and, and to some extent he himself, who have discounted animals as not being worthy of moral consideration. And Bentham says to us, other animals which on account of their interests having been neglected by the insensibility of the ancient jurists stand degraded into the class of things. The day has been, I grieve to say, in many places it is not yet past, in which the greater part of the species under the denomination of slaves has been treated upon the same footing as animals are still. The day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights which could never have been withholden from them but by the hand of tyranny. The French have already discovered that the blackness of skin is no reason why a human being should be abandoned without redress to the caprice of a tormentor. It may one day be recognized that the number of legs, the velocity of skin, or the termination of the os sacrum are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace this insuperable line? Is it the faculty of reason or perhaps the faculty of discourse, Bentham asks, and he concludes, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer?
so I'm going to go through this pretty fast because we don't have a lot of time, um, but the theoretical stuff you've already seen. So there are four basic categories of characteristics that are commonly taken as morally significant. Intelligence, such as being a rational individual. This is Kant and the duty ethicists are the classic example. The first two are actually from secular uh, theories, uh, philosophical theories of morality. Sentience, the ability to feel pain and pleasure. These are Bentham, whom you just saw a quote from, and the utilitarians. And social behavior is often used sometimes as a sign of the above, of intelligence and sentience. And in recent years, some uh, philosophers have been uh, treating it as if it in itself were a morally relevant characteristic. And of course, uh, for certain theologians, the possession of an immortal rational soul or divine spark. I'm going to be focusing, as uh, Elspeth did, on the first three. So history of the concept of a moral subject. At one time or another, these characteristics have been used to argue for the lesser moral status of women, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, and all non-human animals. In recent years, however, they have been extended to all human beings and some non-human animals, the great apes and dolphins uh, being uh, some obvious cases. The following characteristics, notable for their anthropomorphism, are frequently treated as indicators or signs of moral status. I apologize for going fast, but I realize I'm out of time. <laughs> Um, brain anatomy, intelligence, language use, memory, you can just kind of read down these and I'm going to use them in a minute uh, to discuss some interesting cases. So from non-human animals to ET. As social scientists and biologists have documented, many non-human animals, animals display these indicators, but the moral significance of this is often dismissed on the grounds that they don't resemble uh, humans in uh, these ways closely enough. Our species is treated as a standard of judging moral status. So here are some examples. We, uh, we know very well the ones at the top are quite famous, the, the great apes. Uh, there's a border collie that is, uh, knows language quite well, follows orders. There's a, the, the artistic elephant, there are dolphins, and of course there are parrots. But I'm not going to focus on those because I think the most interesting ones are going to be the ones uh, at the bottom, which are the most different from us and yet exhibit some of these morally relevant characteristics, but not all of them. So I'm going to start with some examples. Uh, well, I'll start ET, so intelligence, sentience, and social behavior is going to be our focus. And I want to start with some thought experiments from um, science fiction. So the Hort is an interesting case. Um, some of you may know it's, these are Star Trek uh, examples. The Horta is just kind of a blob of rock that goes and burrows its way, uh, causing wrecking havoc with a bunch of miners on a distant planet. So it's killing the miners, and it's destroying their equipment, and it's just bur burrowing tunnels <laughs> right and left. And um, initially, they think it's just this horrible animal, and they're trying, well, kind of rock animal, and they're trying to kill it. But it eventually achieves its moral status in virtue of its close emotional, sentient, and behavioral parental concern resemblance to humans. It turns out that Vulcan mind melds are great for sentience. Because <laughs> you don't need to worry about whether or not they're just parroting uh, human language. You actually mind meld. And, and, and that sh uh, shows Spock is you know, quivering from all the agony he's getting from the Horda. And uh, he discovers that it is a, an alien mother who's trying to defend her eggs. And immediately, this blob of rock gains moral status in virtue of being sentient and exhibiting the right kind of social behavior, namely a concerned parent about its offspring. So there's a good example from science fiction. These are wonderful thought experiments. The Borg. Now, it resembles humans morphologically. Completely different social structure. It's a hive organism. Even though the individual members resemble human beings, uh, they are all sort of subservient uh, to the hive. It's the hive that has the intelligence. These things wander around as if they were just uh, parts, mindless parts of the hive, but the hive is the intelligent uh, aspect. And its moral status is ambiguous. Uh, there are different Star Treks in which uh, the hive itself, the hive intelligence, 
is sometimes uh, treated as if it had a moral status, but it's, it's quite ambiguous. Now what's interesting, can we do better than science fiction thought experiments? And my answer is yes, but it's going to be embarrassing for us. Cuttlefish don't resemble humans morphologically. They're extraordinarily social, and they have a truly alien communication system. I'm gonna run through it really quickly because it's really interesting. The um, cuttlefish do not have an acoustic communication system. They communicate with patterns of colors and texture of skin. They have chromatophores, and what they do is instantly change in colors. So they have spots of different colors that are flickering. They have splotches. They have different changes in their background colors. And in addition to that, they can raise their uh, skin and get bumpy, or they can smooth it off. So all of this is going into communicating with other cuttlefish and they can warn, they're very social, and they can tell each other, they have special patterns for different predators. They have unique patterns for different predators, and they have this remarkable ability to use polarized light to camouflage themselves to non-cuttlefish and communicate to cuttlefish. Now, is this a language? It's really different than anything we've ever seen. It's not linear. It's two-dimensional, maybe three-dimensional, and so these are creatures that are my Horta analogs. They're very different morphologically. Unfortunately, there's no Vulcan mind meld. So they see, are they sentient? Well, that's the trouble with sentience. Without a Vulcan mind meld, how do you know? Um, and so I just want to point out, these are really interesting creatures to study. Uh, bees do not resemble humans morphologically. Completely different social structure. They're hive organisms and they have very alien communication system. For purposes of time, I'm going to just skip over that since I sort of communicated with you about the um, cuttlefish, but they do dance, they dance, and their dances are very specific to communicating new locations when the hive swarms and, wants to, and is intending to move, and also food, flowers, pollen. And what th they do is they not only dance uh, to communicate where, say, the flowers are, but they also um, in indicate in their dance how enthusiastic they are about this particular location. And so, and they also, when they swarm, they send out scouts who then come back and they communicate uh, the different uh, possibilities. And then there's a kind of chemical um, hive quorum sensing in which the group decides where, where they're going to actually go and swarm. It's, I can't go into the details, but it's extraordinarily interesting. And this is my Borg analog. Octopus are the most interesting, I think. They do not resemble humans morphologically. They're asocial and solitary. They, are, they don't have any social care, but they're remarkable in their intelligent behavior. They escape aquariums. They dismantle pumps. They unscrew jars. And they run mazes, highly complex mazes. So are these creatures um, worthy of uh, our moral concern? Well, you know, in science fiction, often they are. It's really quite ironic that in real life, we ignore them. And that's the end. So this talk will have some connections to the previous two talks, um, which I'm really enjoying. And thank you so much for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about alien minds, believe it or not. Can you hear me now? OK. I'm going to ask two questions. First off, would aliens have conscious experiences? Now, this feeds into the issue of whether they should have moral significance. Um, secondly, how might aliens think? And I'm going to talk about this from the domain of cognitive science and philosophy of mind. So hopefully, even though the questions seem a little out there, this will be a fairly sober-minded discussion, well, more or less. I can't promise you that it's completely sober-minded. OK, so um, I'm going to focus on something different than what a lot of people have been focusing on at this conference. I'm going to focus on alien intelligence that's super intelligent. That is, intelligence that's able to exceed the best human-level intelligence in every field, social skills, general wisdom, scientific creativity, and so on. 
This has been discussed in a new book called Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, who runs the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Also in Ray Kurzweil's books, which I find a little too utopian, frankly. And in my own book, highly speculative and deliberately so, called Philosophy and Science Fiction, which is an anthology on superintelligence as well as other topics in science fiction. So I'm drawing heavily here from the singularity literature, essentially. So why this focus? Well, read the paper for a longer account, but a very quick reason why I think focusing on this might be important is what I call the short window observation. It holds, once any society creates the technology that could put them in touch with the cosmos, they are only a few hundred years away from changing their own paradigm from biology to artificial intelligence or AI. Steve Dick wrote a very interesting paper on this. I know Seth Shostak is um, also a proponent of this view. And Paul Davies discusses this in his book, The Eerie Silence. I'm going to quickly outline some advantages of being a silicon-based system rather than a biological organism. I recognize that this is controversial, but I do think that there's something here worth thinking about. First of all, I believe it would be easier to survive space travel, so these might in fact be the kinds of creatures that we encounter. Second it's easier to reach the level of superintelligence as a silicon-based system. Advanced AI can occupy the space of an entire city or an entire continent. Unfortunately, our brains are limited spatially to the skull. Reboots and system upgrades are possible. Neurons are slow. Thirdly, creatures could upload their minds to achieve near immortality. Um, an upload is a creature that has transferred the contents of her mind onto a computer. Now, as a philosopher, I do have philosophical problems with uploading. You could read my recent opinion piece in the New York Times. But I will not discuss these issues today. I think uploading is attractive to many individuals, and, you know, I think other creatures on other planets die too, and uploading looks pretty darn good for people who are agnostic, and when the technology is available, they might try it. I mean, look at cryogenics, and the technology is not even very good. Fourthly, a society that uploaded would have uploaded copies of deceased members of society, so they could have a collective wisdom network. Be nice to have an upload of Einstein, wouldn't it? Fifth, a global catastrophe could make alien worlds inhospitable to biological life forms. And uploading may be the only way to preserve the alien species' way of life and thinking, if not the actual aliens themselves. So over at Oxford, they're already working on what they call the whole brain emulation project to help us survive, or at least our memories survive, in case of a global catastrophe. So this is already being worked on right now by humans. And I know that's small n, but I do think it's important to look at what's going on in the human case because it's the only information we have. Well, I should say also non-human animals, importantly. Now I'm going to turn to alien consciousness. Would superintelligent aliens be conscious? I'm going to begin by talking about the hard problem of consciousness, which is a problem that philosophers of mind talk about, which has been articulated in the human case. And then I'm going to talk about the problem of alien consciousness, where alien consciousness I'm interested in is a form of AI. So there are special issues that arise. So as cognitive science underscores, when we deliberate, see the rich hues of a sunset, and so on, there's information processing going on in the brain. But above and beyond the manipulation of data, there's a subjective side. There's a felt quality to our experience. The hard problem asks, why doesn't all of our information processing happen in the dark, so to speak? Why does 
why does the world around us feel a certain way when we consider it or when we perceive it? This problem is due to the philosopher David Chalmers. If you hit his website, he wrote a great piece that appeared in Scientific American that's very accessible on this topic. It's a really fun topic to think about. Okay, now here's a problem I made up. I call it the hard problem of alien consciousness. This problem asks, would a superintelligent alien being a computational system have experience? Why would it not just be an information processing system like your computer without experience? So why isn't it just a super sophisticated information processing system without any inner mental life? We can see how this could be relevant to our judgment of moral significance that, you know, to connect this up with the earlier paper. Importantly, this problem is one that we face with superintelligent alien minds, and it is related to the hard problem in the human case, but I do want to mention that the problems are different. Related, but different. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about a view called biological naturalism that's attributed to John Searle, who I understand was a visitor here recently, and he's a former professor of mine when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, um, but I don't agree with his view anymore. Um, but he offers biological naturalism, which is the view that the capacity to be conscious is unique to biological organisms. If biological naturalism is correct, AI can't be conscious. If you replace parts of your brain with silicon parts, insofar as the areas you replaced underwrote your conscious experience, was the biological basis of your experience, you would no longer be conscious because you would now be partly silicon based. If you uploaded, say to avoid death because you wanted to be immortal, you might have your information processing preserved, but if biological naturalism is, naturalism is correct, you would not have conscious experience. Well, you might think that's a way to test biological naturalism, right? I mean, it'd be hard to find a subject, it would be really unethical. But um, no, you couldn't run a test like that, even if um, it was ethical to run, because Creatures would have the same information processing capacity that they had before, so they would behave in the same way. So they would behave as if they were conscious. So how do we determine whether biological naturalism is correct? You can tell you're conscious right now. I hope you're conscious. I hope I haven't put you to sleep yet. There's something it feels like to be you right now. But you can't be certain that the person next to you is conscious. And you can't be absolutely certain. But we do infer that they are, because they have the same kinds of brains as we do, and they behave in similar ways. I mean, it's, you're virtually certain, if not completely certain, that they're conscious. I mean, philosophers will run thought experiments which are skeptical in nature, and so I'm not so sure you can really be certain that the per person next to you is conscious but it's good enough. I don't doubt that any of you are conscious, unless I've put you to sleep. Well, similarly, we can't step inside the heads of aliens should we encounter them. Nevertheless, I believe biological naturalism is probably false. Consider that cognitive science says that thinking is computational. So just as a phone call and a smoke signal can convey the same information, Thought can have both silicon and carbon-based substrates. Indeed, scientists have produced silicon-based artificial neurons that can exchange information with real ones. The neural code increasingly seems to be a computational code. Also, this question strikes me as important. It's one that the biological naturalists have not answered. Why would it something that is actually a better substrate for information processing be a worse medium for consciousness? Why wouldn't it actually 
lead to more advanced forms of consciousness. That's what Kurzweil claims in his imaginative books, and I think it's something that Searle needs to contend with and other biological naturalists. Well, I'm going to conclude then that biological naturalism is likely false. Alien superintelligence can be conscious in principle. How might they think? I'm not going to talk about science fiction, believe it or not. I'm going to talk about cognitive science because I think there are resources available to discuss this matter today. Nick Bostrom has a wonderful new book on superintelligence, which has actually received a lot of media attention. Now, Nick's discussions are solely limited to the genesis of superintelligent artificial intelligence on Earth. Nevertheless, I believe that much of what he says is of relevance to this issue. First of all, he distinguishes three kinds of superintelligent artificial intelligence. Speed superintelligence, which is one that essentially could think much quicker than we can, writing, say, a PhD dissertation in an afternoon, but isn't necessarily going to um, generate a better dissertation than we would, just one that was written quickly. Collective superintelligence has been discussed, in a sense, today because we've talked about the Borg, and that might be a case of a collective where the individual units are not necessarily smart, but the organizational structure is so sophisticated that superintelligence is generated. Finally, quality superintelligence is just the superintelligence that I defined at the beginning. A superintelligence which is vastly smarter than even the smartest humans in virtually every domain, general wisdom, scientific thinking, creativity, and so on. So we could expect that aliens that we encountered that were forms of superintelligent AI could be one or more of these types of superintelligence. Bostrom also asks, could we identify possible common goals across all kinds of superintelligent AI? Again, I think this is very relevant here. It'd be really interesting if we could begin to think about this matter. He offers an, what he calls an orthogonality thesis. It says that intel intelligence and final goals are orthogonal. More or less, any level of intelligence could in principle be combined with more or less any final goal. I think it's important that I observe that this is a reason why AI poses such a grave existential risk when it becomes super intelligent. For this, you should see Bostrom's book and also my rather grim interview in this month's cover story of the Humanist magazine where I talk about the dangers of superintelligent AI. To give one colorful example, Bostrom writes of a superintelligent AI that is built for the sole purpose of generating paper clips. While that doesn't sound so threatening, it uses all the matter that we need to live to generate paper clips. And that's what intelligent life, I don't, artificial life looks like in a post-human era. Now, I'm not saying it will go in this direction, but I think we need to think about these issues. And he has a chapter on what he calls the control problem, which is how to create superintelligent AI that can be contained. He also raises what he calls an instrumental convergence thesis, stating that several instrumental values can be identified which are convergent in the sense that their attainment would increase the chances of the agent's goal being realized for a wide range of final goals. Common goals offered are self-preservation, goal content integrity, that is, its future self will pursue and attain these same goals, resource acquisition, cognitive enhancement, and technological perfection. And of course, the self-preservation goal, he notes, may be overridden in the context of having a final goal that involves the AI's destruction, if it's built by architects who program it in that way. Of course, there's always the question of why a superintelligent AI wouldn't rewrite its own script. Now I'm going to isolate a class of superintelligent AIs that I think might be of particular interest in the context of alien minds. So I'm departing from Bostrom here. 
I call them biologically inspired, super intelligent aliens or bices. So Bostrom says that a great many kinds of super intelligent AI could be developed. AI may not be biologically inspired on Earth, being extremely alien. Biologically inspired superintelligent agents I call BICES. That is, alien superintelligence based on reverse engineering the alien brain. That is, looking to science to find out what algorithms describe that species' thinking patterns and then programming it into an AI system or directly uploading alien minds. Now, this isn't in Bostrom's book at all. I just want to underscore. But it occurs to me that if there are multitudes of ways superintelligent AI can be constructed in different worlds, but a number of alien civilizations develop it from uploading or reverse engineering from members of their own species, it may be that vices are the most common form of alien intelligence out there. You might say, well, that would be a pretty heterogeneous class. Why is it interesting? So what I want to ask is, are there any general observations we could make about vices? There's a lot more in the long version of the paper. But quickly, we might speculate that vices are descended from creatures that had motivations like avoid injury, reproduce, cooperate, compete, and so on. Uploads, in particular, would have those features and may not wish to remove them. Think about it. If you uploaded, would you want to remove certain features which are pretty hardwired into your biological brain, like your survival instinct? Contra Bostrom, we can speculate that they would have final goals involving their own survival. Remember, survival was just an um, instrumental goal for Bostrom but I'm saying it could be a final goal for BICES. And it could be group or individual survival, because, of course, we have to remember the hive case. And possibly reproduction could be important. So an amusing scenario would be one in which BICES, interested in reproducing, create computer simulations in which all kinds of intelligent, conscious life exists. There's an intriguing paper available at Nick Bostrom's website arguing that we are, in fact, in a computer simulation. It's a good paper. <laughs> based on brains evolved to, they, excuse me, biases could also be based on brains evolved to deal with biological constraints like slow processing speed and the spatial limitations of the body. Okay. Objection. Philosophers like objections. I couldn't resist. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to be done in just a few minutes. It is useless to theorize about biases, as they can change their basic architecture in numerous unforeseen ways. My answer is, yeah, some probably will. But since a bisa is biologically based, it may have survival as a primary goal. In this case, it may not want to change its basic architecture. It may want to stick to improvements on that basic architecture. It may think, when you alter your basic ar architecture, you are no longer you. An interesting question to ask would be, what cognitive capacities or perceptual capacities could be augmented to increase a bias's potential to realize instrumental or final goals? In conclusion, we have just said something, or we've tried to say something, about alien minds without talking about um, science fiction. And that was hard for me since I have a book on science fiction. Um, advanced alien civilizations will likely be super intelligent, or maybe I should say the most advanced civilizations. Super intelligences can be conscious even if they are forms of AI. In general, superintelligent AI can have any final goal, but we can pinpoint instrumental ones. BICES may be the largest subgroup because there are so many different types of superintelligence that can be generated. 
Final goals may be more survival and reproduction oriented for a BISA. So this would constitute an exception to Bostrom's orthogonality thesis. And finally, they may have upgraded versions of certain cognitive capacities that biological intelligences had. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, uh, so we have two more presentations uh, that will happen as part of this panel. And after the presentations, we will call up our moderator, uh, Connie Berka, and uh, she will facilitate a Q&A among all of the panelists. Um, and after uh, some brief Q&A with the, among all the panelists, reacting and responding to each of their uh, respective papers, we will open it up to audience question and answer. Uh, as a reminder, with the audience question and answer period, uh, we will have one microphone circulating throughout the room. Uh, when called on to ask your question, please wait for the microphone. Uh, that way we can capture the question on the camera and for the webcast. Uh, and please do uh, ask a question and ask the question uh, concisely, succinctly. Uh, if you have a, a statement that you wish to make, please make that statement uh, concisely and succinctly as well and allow the, the panelists to respond. And also please allow us to move on to the next question. That way as many questions from the audience can be taken as we can. Uh, so um, I'd like to now call up uh, Brother Guy Kansamanyu to continue with this panel and then we'll move on from there. In uh, September of 2012, I was in Birmingham, England. I was there to give an astronomy talk at the Birmingham Science Festival because basically I'm an astronomer. But it turns out the day I was there was actually the same day that Pope Benedict was in Birmingham, England. And so the cream of British journalism was there. And I had agreed to be interviewed by reporters to promote the British, you know, the, the Birmingham Science Festival. But all they wanted to ask me about was the Pope. Except they kept asking, like, what's your biggest source of conflict with the Pope? Or when was the last time the Pope tried to interfere with your work? Uh, completely out of left field. You know, this is... Uh, not only is he a good scientist, he even brings his own white coat. <laughs> Finally, frustrated that they weren't getting the story they wanted to get, one of them asks me, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? So I answered, yeah, only if she asks. And, and it got a good laugh. And then the next day, it was all run in all the newspapers as if I had made some sort of official Vatican pronouncement about aliens. Okay, but, but why that reaction? Certainly it's a popular question. It's a question that's so popular that my colleague Paul Muller and I decided to use it as the title of the book we have coming out in a couple of weeks. A lot of the material in this talk is coming from that book, so obviously go out and buy the book. It's such a good book, you should buy two copies. We obviously think that this title will sell copies of the book. But, but why? Why do people ask us that question so often? I think one reason is the challenge that's inherent in a question of this sort. Think about those other questions that the reporters were asking me, you know, has the Pope tried to suppress your science and so on. They were pretty aggressive questions. The reporters were looking for a juicy story they were looking for ways to make me look stupid, or at least to make my church look stupid. For them, would you baptize an extraterrestrial was a trick question. It was an attempt to get me into a gotcha moment. Think about it. If I had said, yes, I would baptize E.T., then I would look cosmically naive. I would have been saying that dumb little human me thinks he has the right to preach to highly advanced aliens about what they should believe, Aliens so far advanced that they were able to cross the incredible distances of space to visit us. On the other hand, if I had said no, I would not baptize E.T., then I'd be admitting that Christianity has no universal significance, no cosmic significance. It's nothing more than a local superstition amusing for the yokels on this little point here, but not really important in the grand scheme of things. 
So they thought they had me trapped. But when I blurted out the first thing I could think of, you know, only if she asks, I turned the tables on them. I made baptism not my decision, but E.T.'s decision. If E.T., with all of her superior technology, decides freely to ask for baptism, if E.T., with all of her advanced knowledge, accepts that our human savior has something important and some sort of meaning for her, well, then it would make all the, the reporters look kind of foolish. In times past, thinkers on both sides of the religious issue have used the possibility of extraterrestrial life to support their preconceptions. For example, the German theologian Joseph Pohl argued that the glory of God demands that the universe be filled with intelligent beings, not just us. On the other hand, the American radical Thomas Paine uses the inevitability of life in other worlds to mock Christianity. He argues in the Age of Reason that Christianity demanded either the unlikely proposition that of all the worlds in the universe, God chose to be incarnated only in ours because one guy and one girl decided to eat an apple, or else there were many incarnations such that, to quote him, the person who is irreverently called the Son of God would have nothing else to do than travel from world to world in an endless succession of death with scarcely a momentary interval of life. Paine's well, argument, though crude, deserves an answer. In fact, it's not outside the possibility that we are, in fact, in a unique position in the universe, nor is it equally possible that the second person of the Trinity, as the Christians would put it, who, according to St. John in the start of the Gospel, is present in the beginning as the Word, could be expressed as a Word in more than one place, spoken in more than one language. You know, the multiple lives and deaths that Thomas Paine is mocking actually mirror what fundamental Catholic teaching is of what goes on at the sacrifice of the Mass a million times a day. Besides, Who's to say that every race's salvation story has to be exactly the same? You know, think of the legends we have about the fall of angels. Appreciating God as a creator of a universe big enough to contain billions and billions of galaxies and stars makes you appreciate how infinite such a God must be. Contemplating what it would mean for humans to encounter aliens forces us to ask in a new way, just what does it mean to be human? You know, human as compared to what? Asking for what it would take for an alien to have something like a soul forces us to confront just what do we mean when we use that word? Speculating on how Christ's salvation could apply to other beings actually is a wonderful way to appreciate all over again what that salvation means to us humans. Now, the literature of science fiction is filled with alien creatures, sentient computers, half-human, half-machine constructs. Fantasy stories add a whole spectrum of mythical elves and ghosts and whatever you want. But the central character of any such story, regardless of how many tentacles it has, is, in one sense, recognizably human, self-aware, free to choose, free to love, free to hate, free to do good, or free to sin, and thus in need of some kind of redemption. It's no surprise that so many of the people who write these stories actually come from a very deep religious background. I have three Catholics up here. Indeed, a common insight of these stories is that any creature of the universe created and loved by the same God who created and loved us, presumably, would be subject not only to the same laws of physics and chemistry, as we heard earlier yesterday, but presumably also the same rules of right and wrong. And if that's the case, then what else is there except the superficial accident of what gas they breathe or how many genders they have that makes them any different from us? Is there any important way that they would deserve to be called alien or that we would be alien to them. If there are planets suitable for life, if there is life on those planets, 
if that life is intelligent, if that life is in a free, self-aware, loving relationship with the Creator, if that life can communicate to us about their experience of that relationship, well, that's a lot of ifs. If it's so, certainly we could have a lot of talk about each other. It might be a lot of fun. We could learn an awful lot from each other. But if any one of that chain of ifs turns out to be wrong, we'll never know. And right now we don't know. And that's all right, as long as we recognize that what we're doing here is speculation. Because even though we realize the issue of really communicating with such creatures isn't frankly likely to come up in our lifetimes, the possibility that another God-fearing intelligence could be out there someplace is certainly real and certainly worth thinking about. We have to recognize, though, that there is another reason why people worry about these things. I start with this, this classic Pogo cartoon. Anybody here remember Pogo from the 50s and 60s, sort of the, the Doonesbury of that generation? Um, the philosopher on the Pogo strip is the porcupine. And he says, I've been reading about how maybe there's planets out there peopled by folks with advanced brains. Or maybe, on the other hand, we've got the most brains. Maybe our intellects are the most advanced in the universe. Either way, it's a sobering thought. There's a twist you can put on this. Because I think there's another reason why a lot of people are not just curious, but hungry to be visited by alien beings. You see the world full of pain, full of injustice, full of disease. The hope is that any race advanced enough to cross the stars and visit us must also be advanced enough to show how to overcome all those human ills. They look to the aliens to be the saviors of mankind. Just this week, I got another one of those emails I get all the time demanding, demanding, that I tell Pope Francis, as if he's going to listen to me, that he tell us the truth about ETs. I, I quote from the email, ET life is likely to be more ethically evolved, less satanic than humans. Pope Francis must emphasize these themes of extraterrestrials, that they don't share an original sin, that they're more ethically involved, that they're capable of showing the, sharing the Christian message I love how this writer seems to know for certain all these things about these creatures that may not even exist. Because after all, who's to know that they're better or worse? To paraphrase Walt Kelly, maybe they're better than us. Maybe we're the most ethical creatures in the universe. Wouldn't that be a sobering thought? Okay, maybe a correspondent is right. Maybe the extraterrestrials exist. Maybe they are less satanic than human beings. Uh, maybe they can get us to live better lives. Maybe they can be our brothers. Maybe they can even teach us to use gender neutral language. I don't know. But consider the fate of the alien in this classic science fiction movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, who came to Earth to help mankind. It's uh, not a happy ending. And actually, didn't we already have a savior on earth? And, and look what happened to him. Uh, the makers of the movie, to emphasize the parallel, even have their alien call himself Mr. Carpenter. You never noticed that before. Remember the insight of science fiction. Any creature of this universe should be subject not only to the same laws of physics and chemistry, but the same rules of right and wrong. If you came across a race that never sinned, how do you know that they have the freedom, the freedom you need to actually be good? There's an essential point that's been missed in a lot of these, the, the discussion we hear when you talk about advanced or less advanced. Science is cumulative. The science books I used in college I throw away because we know now more 40 years ago than we did when I was in school. Ethics is not cumulative. Every generation, every person has to make the same decisions and we can't depend on somebody else to have made those decisions for us.
Besides, I'd say looking for ETs so that we'll all become better behaved children is the wrong way to think about the problem. It's kind of baptizing the universe, if you will, imposing our own preconceptions on the universe. We are rightly wary about imposing our view of religion for or against onto aliens. We should also be wary of imposing our view of religion onto the way we do the science that might find those aliens. Instead of baptizing the aliens, we wind up baptizing the science. What do I mean, baptizing the science? It's, it's looking at the Big Bang Theory and saying, aha, the universe started with light, just like it said in Genesis. Must be true. Mm, not really. Or it's like looking at a possible uni origin of the universe as a quantum fluctuation of the gravity field and say, aha, we don't need God to start the universe because the gravity field started the universe. Actually, all that does is it shows that the gravity field is God. And if God is gravity, now you know why Catholics celebrate Mass. <laughs> Either way, it's a circular argument. You wind up just concluding the very thing you assumed at the beginning of the argument. We've looked through, and, and, and Stephen has written about this, the history of how people assumed there would or would not be extraterrestrials. Believers insist that finding extraterrestrial intelligence will confirm their belief in God. Atheists are convinced that when we find extraterrestrial intelligence, it will show the stupidity of all religions. Interestingly, neither of these groups of people are using the fact that we haven't found extraterrestrials yet to admit that they were wrong which is to say it is not a critical experiment. You just wind up reading into the universe the assumptions you make about the universe ahead of time. Would you baptize ET can be heard in a couple of different ways, different emphases. It can be heard, would you baptize ET? In other words, who are you to let the ET into the club? Or would you baptize E.T.? Is E.T. somebody you want to have in your club? The early Christians had the same ambiguity. Paul argues with James and Peters and the others about whether or not to let the Gentiles, the non-Jews, into the Christian side, if they could be baptized. So a few months ago, Pope Francis was referring to that conflict in a homily. And so he said, you've got to understand what it was like for the early church in the first century. Baptizing Gentiles to them would be as strange as baptizing Martians today. You know, what happened if a Martian came up? Would you baptize them? Naturally, the press decided the Pope had just endorsed baptizing extraterrestrials. Um, my, my favorite website, the Eye of the Tiber, is sort of the onion for Catholics. And this is how they reacted. You know, Minotaurs and Krakens, no, I wouldn't baptize them. The actual question, though, raises an important point. All religions have some kind of rite of passage, whether you call it baptism or not. Once you've gone through the rite of passage, once you're in the club, you're a peer, you've, you're an equal, you have certain rights, you have certain privileges. But life within a religion, presumably, is more than just rights and privileges. You know, like, like the dog here running across the street. You shouldn't have to get across the street alone. The dogs on the other side ought to be helping you across the street. There's another thing about that question, would you baptize E.T.? No matter how many times I've answered that question, people keep asking it. Which makes me think, maybe it's the wrong question. Maybe it's not that our answer is wrong. Maybe we should be asking a different question. Um, would you share a meal with E.T.? Is E.T. willing to share a meal with me? If I saw E.T. sick by the side of the road, would I stop and tend to its needs? Would I allow E.T. to do that for me? Am I willing to suffer and die? For an ET? Is ET willing to suffer and die for me? If ET and I can both answer yes to these questions, we're already together in the kingdom of God. Religion exists 
to foster a relationship between us and God. Such a relationship, you hope, is based on love. It presumes that we find something special in God, that God finds something special in us. Usually, the religious idea that humanity is at the center of God's love is taken to mean that God loves humanity in a way that's different from how God loves the rest of the universe. You know, if, if humanity is at the center of God's love, then the rest of the universe isn't. But that's not how love works. Love doesn't exclude, it includes. It, it, it's true of human love. It's all the more true of God's love, of God is love. Someone who falls in love treats everybody better, loves everybody more. When God falls in love with us, God treats the whole universe better. God treats everything in the universe as if he's fallen in love with it. Maybe if we are at the center of God's love and concern, there's something about us that God loves. And what if, whatever that something is, that God loves about us, it's not something that separates us from the universe, but rather is something we have in common with the rest of the universe. Something that is utterly characteristic of and typical of the rest of the universe. We humans are, are material, we're thinking, we're feeling, we're willing, we're free, we're loving. In us, the universe has become self-aware. All of us, whatever planet, whatever place, whatever space, whatever time, we are the bearers of the purpose for which the universe exists. We are all the center of the universe. What God loves in us, God loves in the rest of the universe. We are at the center of God's love and attention because we are so utterly typical and characteristic of what the universe is. You know, Carl Sagan once said that we are made of star stuff. Maybe stars in some essential way are also participating in we stuff. This, this existence of other self-aware entities raises an interesting challenge to each of us. Are we willing to accept the presence of another self-aware entity in the universe? Even as we're aware of the presence of God, are we willing to accept that there could be other entities besides me and God who are also aware of that God? Because think about it. Intelligence only makes sense if there's someone else to share that intelligence with. We only grow and stretch ourselves when we're challenged to relate to others. That's why we're having this convention instead of, you know, just thinking all about it to myself. The ability to be self-aware, the free will to act on that awareness, that implies, maybe that even demands, the existence of other entities who are self-aware, whom we can choose to love or to ignore. You know, to put it in the words of my own Christianity, it means admitting that it's for all of us that the second person died, for all of us that the universe was born. I end and put up here a piece of science fiction from 1917 by the uh, British poet Alice Menel. And I'll just leave it there for you to read or reference. Thank you. Well, like all of the speakers, I want to thank Stephen Dick and the Kluge Center for this opportunity to participate in this symposium. I work at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey, where our purpose is to engage theology in dialogue with other disciplines, and I rarely get to do that as comprehensively as we've done it in these two days here. Astrobiology provides an unusual opportunity to lift the constraints that we usually put on our thinking, and that has benefits, I think, when we return to the problems that we ordinarily deal with in our separate disciplines. The program labeled our topic this morning, the philosophical impact of discovery, 
I think if we take these uh, presentations as a whole, we might say that what we've been talking about this morning is the moral impact of discovery. Theology takes a particular interest in these questions because like, uh, it, because in many religious traditions, human life has a special status. This we, we also heard uh, in Brother Guy's uh, presentation. So we say in the traditions that come from the Hebrew Bible uh, that humanity is created in the image of God. Or in more abstract terms, we say that persons have a human dignity, that they share a status that requires us to treat all of them equally and to treat them differently from the ways that we treat other life. You don't have to read created in the image of God in a literalistic way to see that thinking about human life against that backdrop is something different than what science is doing when it looks at human life in relation to a biological background. So I want to begin by saying three things about what theology is and what it tries to do in re that may help you to locate what these theological questions are about in relation to the other kinds of inquiry that we've been thinking about in these two days. First and foremost, of course, theology is speaking, reasoning, and thinking about God. As the Greek roots imply, theology is words, logos, about God, theos. And in the same way that biology is words about life, or geology is words about the earth. And I should emphasize for present purposes that theology is a word about God rather than the word from God, although theologians themselves get confused at that point, on that point uh, from time to time. Second, theology is almost always embedded in a tradition. That's one thing that separates it from a philosophical interpretation, although philosophy has its traditions as well. Theology, in any case, is embedded in a set of texts, in a set of narratives, in a set of arguments and practices that provide the starting points when theologians come to deal with new questions like, how would we understand a different form of life? To speak intelligibly about God, we have to begin with some broader frame of reference within which others can locate what we're saying. And this embeddedness in tradition is essential because third, theology is an interpretive discipline in contrast to an experimental science. Theology's task is to make sense of reality as a whole and to provide an orientation for meaningful action within that reality. And this again is something that you can't just start to do from nowhere. You have to have a framework for the interpretation, however inarticulate or inadequate your framework may be, because then you can refine it and enlarge it in relation to new questions and new choices. And that's basically the, the kind of reinterpretation that we're thinking about here. Now, precisely because this interpretive work goes on in a particular tradition, I don't know how to explore the relationship between theology and astrobiology except to take up one of those traditions and see how it works out. Uh, Stephen Dick mentioned earlier that, that we really need uh, a word from the Asian religious and cultural traditions as a part of this whole discussion. Uh, and then the question of how those traditions deal with these issues and which one of them might help us do that better. That's something I hope we'll, we'll see in the book, but for the moment I'm going to do Astrobiology and Theology 101 uh, and start with uh, the Christian tradition. And, and that is to say I'm going to talk about humanity in the image of God, which has resonances in Christian, Jewish, and Islamic thought. And I want to follow through some of the ways that the Christian interpretation of that idea has worked. Many theologians and philosophers 
have argued that persons have a special status precisely because they are a form of life that can ask the kinds of questions that we're asking here. Uh, to pick up on the previous presentation, you know, one of the things that uh, would make an extraterrestrial intelligence special and worthy of consideration is uh, precisely that it could ask whether it wanted to be baptized. So, human beings are aware that their life has a meaning that is not exhausted by their material circumstances and is not summed up simply by the results of what they do. And it's that awareness that gives them a dignity that doesn't depend on their place in a social or economic system, on their wealth, their power, their accomplishments, or what they have achieved in comparison with others. That idea of human dignity runs across many religious and philosophical traditions. It's a term that uh, theologians also like to use. But traditions, unlike theologians, don't establish the human connection to transcendent reality in abstract terms like dignity. Traditions speak in terms of humanity being created in the image of God. And all three of the, what are often called the Abrahamic traditions, take uh, as their starting point for that the uh, verse in Genesis 127 in which God creates humanity in God's own image. Now for our, prob for our purposes, the problems that that verse raises are not the result of the fact that there are some people who read this text in a very literal way. The more basic problem that we need to think about is that astrobiology calls our attention to the fact that we're talking here about human dignity, about the human image of God. That qualifier, human dignity and human image, ordinarily fades into the background precisely because we're talking about a status that is held by every person on the planet. But the qualifier becomes important when we think about encounters with life somewhere else in the universe. So just as our knowledge of life is for the moment confined to this single example of life on Earth, so too human dignity is the only kind of dignity we know. To recur to a theme that has come up in several of these presentations, N equals one in theology, just as it does in biology. So theology explores the implications of this dignity and thus establishes a moral relationship between persons. The image of God demands a certain kind of respect, both for ourselves and for other people. In the Hebrew scripture, the image of God also establishes our relationship to other forms of terrestrial life. Since it's in the very next verse in Genesis that humanity is assigned dominion over other living things and is commanded to subdue the earth. Now, we're all familiar with the problems that are created by an unqualified endorsement of having dominion and subduing the earth. But I think that those problems, like the problems that arise from the literalistic reading of the creation narrative, can be resolved. What's more challenging for our purposes here today is whether the way that theology locates us in a moral world in relation to terrestrial life can tell us anything at all about what it would be like to deal with other life. Planet Earth seems to be a moral planet. That's one of the themes of the presentations we've heard this morning. That's assured precisely by our shared human nature and by our inescapable responsibility for the other forms of life we know ourselves to be chemically and biologically related to. 
But what happens beyond Earth's biosphere? It might turn out, of course, that human dignity is the only kind of dignity that there is, just as it might turn out that terrestrial life is the only life in the universe. Or it might turn out that we have a run of good luck in which the only kind of dignity we encounter is close enough to human dignity that we could recognize it without much trouble, uh, say not much more trouble than we have in sometimes seeing it in some of our terrestrial neighbors. But astrobiology warns us not to expect that kind of discovery. We do not know what kind of life we may actually discover, but systematic preparation for discovery, which is what astrobiology is about, has to assume the possibility of many different forms of life, even many forms of intelligent life, that are radically different from our own. We may even have trouble recognizing them as alive. The question is whether we could recognize them as having dignity. One way to answer that question is to return to the idea of analogy, which has come up in several ways in our discussions over these two days, because theology, too, has a way of analogical thinking. We talked about the problems of anthropocentrism that can creep even into our scientific understanding of the universe, but theology worries about anthropocentrism, too in the way that we understand the universe and the way that we understand God. That's why the same tradition that talks about humanity being made in the image of God forbids us to make gods in the image, image of humanity. The biblical prohibition on idolatry is another way of warning us against thinking that we can make sense of reality as a whole simply by projecting our own experience onto it. Theology instead develops complex analogies to determine what can be said about the reality of God without simply projecting human experience onto that reality and how we can make sense of a reality that is so much greater than our intelligence and reality in terms of human experience without reducing it to human experience. The focus of those analogies is the idea of consciousness and freedom. Augustine, writing in the early fifth century, described this freedom as the interplay of reason, will, and memory. And he suggested that all of these must exist in God in some way analogous to the way that they give us our identity as persons. Human creativity, then, is a very limited image of God's awareness and freedom, but the analogy between them suggests what it is in us that both enables our relationship to God and constrains our relationships with one another. So the possibility of discovering life elsewhere in the universe raises the question whether this tradition of analogical thinking about God and human dignity could be put to use in a quite different way to recognize the image of God in other forms of life that do not share the physical and biological history from which human life has emerged. While we don't yet have an instance of extraterrestrial life against which we could test our idea of human dignity, there are several things that suggest themselves already from the preparatory thinking that astrobiology has done about what such a discovery would be like. First, given the statistical probability of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, the fact that we have yet to detect any evidence of that life leads to the conclusion that successful communication between different forms of life is a difficult achievement, probably requiring a highly developed technical society that makes a civilizational commitment to the project that extends across a considerable period of time. This suggests 
that any intelligent life we are able to discover, however different or distant it may be from ourselves, will have capacities for reason, will, and memory that are analogous to our own. There is then a presumption of dignity in any intelligent life, a presumption that argues against attempts at conquest, conversion, deception, or exploitation, just as our own dignity argues against quick surrender or slavish imitation of an intelligence that appears to be far superior to our own. So first, astrobiology suggests that there's a presumption of dignity in any intelligent life that we encounter. Second, astrobiology encourages us not to look at biological evolution in isolation, but rather to think in terms of a complex system of biological and cultural evolution that might at some point transcend the biological limitations with which a particular form of life begins. Notwithstanding the charming fictional encounters with individual extraterrestrials, any intelligent life elsewhere in the universe is going to present itself to us as the cultural expression of a biological infrastructure and not as individual life forms. We may suppose that we too will appear to other intelligent life uh, that may encounter us as a, a cultural system built on top of a biological infrastructure. And we should prepare ourselves for such encounters by beginning to think about the dignity of cultures or civilizations as well as the dignity of persons. So second implication is that cultures and civilizations share in, participate in the dignity of persons. Third, because astrobiology thinks in terms of the long history of life in any given environment, the discovery of life beyond our own biosphere must be seen for what it may become as well as for what it now is. Indeed, we should say not just the discovery of life for what it now is, but for what it was when the information we get about that life started on the long journey through which it eventually reaches us. Astrobiology confronts us then with the fact that we must look at any form of life we encounter in relation to what it may become as well as what it was when that information headed in our direction. Responsibility for decisions about the physical and biological resources of our terrestrial environment is an inevitable feature of our human dignity. That's the truth, I think, that is concealed in that Genesis passage that gives us a lot of us so much trouble about the idea of having dominion over the earth. It's a responsibility that's built into our place in the terrestrial environment. We can exercise it responsibly, selfishly, ignorantly, or carelessly, but we can't refuse it. But that mandate does not extend to uh, other parts of the universe, to other ecospheres and other forms of life. We may have moral obligations to ex uh, respect these ecospheres and leave them undisturbed, even if they are not or not yet part of the biological infrastructure of an intelligent civilization. The same respect that we would show for the dignity of another civilization requires us to prepare for the discovery of even simple and so-called primitive forms of life by beginning to think about the dignity of life itself. So life itself has dignity. I offer that, these then as three implications of an astrobiological reinterpretation of our understanding of that 
tradition about humanity being created in the image of God. Theology has been linked for a long time to speculation about the place of life in the universe. As systematic and scientifically rigorous astrobiology develops as a discipline, theological reflection on human nature and human dignity will have a role to play in how we understand the moral claims of life, whether in our own form or in some vastly different form. In the distant future, when direct exchanges with other intelligent life may be possible, the long terrestrial movement toward universal recognition of human dignity will be relevant to our transactions with other intelligent life. In the meantime, astrobiological anticipations of those exchanges may help us with some further thinking about the meaning of human dignity and life on Earth. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll continue the tradition we started yesterday, uh, but ask the panelists to be mindful of our time because we're a little bit over now. But what we've been doing is asking, uh, giving the panelists a chance to, in one sense, critique their own talk. You know, is there something you'd like to add now that you've heard other people speak or something you forgot or, or just summarize for us in a couple sentences your main point? Let's start with Mark. Okay, I guess I would add one quick little tidbit that I forgot, which was that I wanted to mention that I had this exchange with Stuart Brand um, a couple years ago. He chaired a philosophy session at the 100-year Starship Symposium, first one, and uh, I presented in, in the symposium and asked him afterwards, um, what does he think a reasonable time horizon is in general when thinking about the future of humanity and maybe the future in general, and I said, of course, it depends on the, exact, the specific problem, but just in general, and he said, oh, well, infinity. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when he said that, I, part of me was like, well, okay, yeah, that you know, makes some sense, and in other ways, it's very, very challenging, but I guess I wanted to say that because in these contemplations, you know, embedded in them is this value of very, very, very long-term infinity um, contemplation. It may be completely misguided, um, on the other hand, it, it may not, um, and then it raises the question, how do you do that? How many scenarios do you go through? Epistemologically, what's involved in that kind of uh, contemplation? I think when it comes to questions of ETI, it's not unreasonable to think extremely long-term. How much you spend on it is another question, but I, I do think it's reasonable. Well, I have a couple points to make. Um, one is really just a simple question for the last two speakers. Um, so. You know, given that I just spoke about superintelligent AI, I wonder if you would baptize superintelligent <laughs> alien AI. Indeed, that's a question that may emerge on Earth. And I also wonder if they have anything like dignity or if they would constitute persons in some extended sense. Mm -hmm. So that's the first comment, which is really just a question. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise here and that I didn't really get time to talk about too much, and I'd suggest if you're interested you look at the long version of the paper, is that if you're sympathetic to the idea that at least some advanced alien civilizations would be forms of superintelligent AI, then it doesn't hurt to actually engage with some of the literature in contemporary cognitive science. I think there are some suggestive questions we could pursue today. So I'll give you an example. Would examining the connectomes of the aliens that the Bices were based upon be useful in telling us about the algorithms that they utilize to compute? So in other words, if alien superintelligence is created based on principles of reverse engineering from the original species, then looking at the actual brains of the original members of the species could give us perhaps some sort of insight into the computations of superintelligent AI. And I think that's important because for those of you who are familiar with the literature on superintelligence, it's by definition a type of intelligence which we can't really get a handle on because it's vastly smarter than us. So anything that we can do 
in this context could be constructive and it could also be brought to bear on earthly matters like the genesis of superintelligent AI on Earth. So a point I would like to emphasize is one cannot evaluate the moral status of an organism independently of its chemical composition, its morphology, its physical structure, its native environment, and its way of life. And I think sometimes we forget that and we take our own highly specialized ways of life. We're very social creatures uh, and our construction, um, the ways in which we, our language is very linear, um, it's acoustic, and we assume that any other organisms who might have a very different way of life, uh, might live in a very different environment, uh, and might have a very different morphology. If they aren't like us, then they're um, in these ways, they're not really uh, you know, moral subjects, let alone moral agents. And that's why I think the examples that I gave, I mean, science fiction pushes the envelope, but we really have examples here on Earth of organisms that are analogs to some of these sci-fi examples. And I think that we ought to be looking at them much more closely in preparation for thinking about the moral status of ET. And I really like octopi. You know why octopuses? You know why I like octopuses? Because they're asocial and solitary. Right. And they are extraordinarily intelligent, but they don't exhibit compassion. They don't exhibit guilt. They exhibit extreme curiosity. Uh, and here are animals that aren't going to exhibit love, they're not going to exhibit you know, caring for others, but they're really curious and they're really smart. There are octopi, octopuses, um, there's an octopus, I have trouble with that. There's an octopus which notoriously, and it's actually happened in more than one aquarium, um, used, they will escape, they can even sometimes unlock the uh, lids of their aquarium, they go out and they raid the fish in the other aquarium, and then during the day they come back in and they go back into the thing, shut the lid, and there they are. <laughs> and they finally discovered them because they found water tracks back and forth. Uh, somebody came out early enough that the water hadn't evaporated. So, you know, here's an organism. People were talking about their social status, about love, about all of these very uh, emotional characteristics that humans have. And these organisms don't have it. Um, are they sentient? Well, Vulcan mind melds are unfortunately beyond us, and we often don't even take primates, which are able to communicate with us, they say they're just imitating us. They, you can't trust what they're really saying. Uh, so um, I think that, you know, absent a Vulcan mind meld, maybe technology will provide us with that, but I doubt it very seriously. Um, I think that's a, a very important issue. And I just want to say one other thing. A machine that makes only paper clips is not super intelligent. <laughs> yeah, you're, it should be doing something really interesting. Well, it should be able to say, it should right. be able to say, I quit it. I'm sick of making paper yeah, clips. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe it will rewrite its algorithm. Elspeth. Um, just to, uh, to go off what Carol said, I think uh, one of our big points is science cannot answer these questions of ought, what we should do, these value questions. Science alone cannot answer them. Uh, we need to look at ethics, but that these two disciplines, these two um, sort of uh, practices are very intertwined with each other. So facts also matter for ethics, as, as Carol was saying. And, and that's really, I think, the main thing we want to emphasize in our talk. But uh, just one thing that I um, didn't develop as much in, um, in the talk is that we are uh, giving a secular, a talk in secular ethics, which differentiates us from the last two, um, two speakers. And while I think that um, theological and religious um, thinking and ideas are extraordinarily interesting and important here, um, I also think that secular ethics is particularly important because that's what we're going to be relying on, or at least falling back on, when it comes to, to law and to public policy. And this is simply a practical assertion that law and public policy in the United States, and also on an international level at the uh, UN, um, <coughs> tends to be framed um, in a secular manner. And the reason for this is, um, number one, the fact of pluralism, that we have a plurality of different worldviews and religions, um, uh, worldviews that are not religious and worldviews that are religious uh, in this country and around the world. Um, we have 
uh, a plurality of different types of Christianity. Um, we have Muslims, we have a Jewish political thought, or I'm sorry, Jewish, well, we have Jewish political thought, but we also, <laughs> we also have, uh, that was a, a slip of the tongue, um, we also have a, a Jewish theological and religious thought, um, and we have <coughs> uh, Eastern traditions, as we heard about yesterday, um, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, the list goes on. And it's important to recognize pluralism when thinking about this. And, and finally, uh, this is obviously why we have the First Amendment and the founders um, enshrined this uh, in our First Amendment. We're here in the Jefferson Building, um, so it's appropriate, uh, to, I think, to mention that. And it was to protect these religious worldviews and to find a point where perhaps we can reach agreement and consensus. So. Um, that's why we think that secular ethics is particularly important here, although um, we think that theological and religious voices are fascinating and, and likewise should be um, part of the debate. It's funny in some ways, I'm sitting up here with the collar, that I may be the most skeptical person on this panel, uh, at least in some of the ideas that have been expressed up to now. Um, my skepticism comes from my scientific background, from the fact that you know at MIT, I knew the Minsky's back in the 70s. And uh, I've had a chance to get to know Noam Chomsky that a lot of the ideas you've expressed are ideas I've lived with for more than 40 years. And I knew, I, I, mean, I first visited the AI lab at MIT in 1972. We've made computers a lot more clever then. I don't know that we've made them any more intelligent. One of the things I worked on as a Jesuit novice was to work in a sheltered workshop with severely retarded men. And these men could not count past three, but they spoke English perfectly. Which means that trying to fit intelligence onto a linear scale is dangerous. Trying to therefore judge one species over another on a linear scale is dangerous. For all that I'm skeptical, that's different from saying I disagree, because I don't. At the end of the day, I think the lesson that comes out of all of this is that we have to be aware of our own limitations. We have to be aware of how much we don't know whenever we're encountering any different planet any different species, any different form of communication. The, uh, the thing that I've gotten the most out of listening the last two days is, this may sound horrible, it may sound very egotistical, well, so now you know who I am. <laughs> How happy I am to come from a religious tradition because I can view all of these questions within my religion that allows me to evaluate them, fit them together, put them into a system that makes sense. Because in some ways, it's the religion that asks us, why are we doing this? Why would the computer want to make paper clips? Maybe there's a deep theological significance to making clever clips that you know, is, is beyond me. Why do we want to encounter the aliens? Why do we study science? Why do we think there's more to life than reproduction and pleasure? These are fundamentally religious questions. And to take what you've just said and agree with you, but put it in a different way, there is a Jewish political idea. There is a Christian political idea. Everything we do comes and comes colored by the culture we came from, the religion we came from, the gender we are, the age we are, the generation we are. And we have to strive to be able to communicate across those things, but we have to never forget that even if we've rejected, we're still part of that culture. Even if uh, I'm convinced that what they're doing at the AI lab is not AI, I'm a product of MIT, and I have that way of thinking still built into me and that someone who came from a heretical school like Caltech may have a different idea. <laughs> and I have to respect them even though they're wrong. <laughs>
So that seems to be an example of human dignity, in fact. <laughs> exactly. Even people from Caltech yeah. have, have human dignity. Uh, yeah, to, just to pick up on the, on the question of traditions, because, because I, I think this is something that this kind of audience worries about a lot. You know, if, do we limit our ability to deal with these questions by tying the reflections as closely as I did to a particular tradition? Or on the other hand, do we have to recognize that all of those political science traditions and philosophical traditions have also their own uh, uh, traditions that shape the, the, the inquiry? What makes me a little nervous about the idea of a secular uh, philosophy as, as our basis here is that in this room earlier this year, I delivered a lecture on the shrinking moral vocabulary of American public life. Uh, that, is, that is to say, I think we do have a secular uh, way of looking at problems but the language that we've got available for thinking about problems in that secular sphere is, is shrinking. Uh, and part of the function, I said this back in January, but I'll say it again, part of the function of gatherings like this and of institutions like the Library of Congress is finding ways to enrich that public moral discussion out of the variety of traditions that, that we can bring to bear on, on these problems. Uh, you know, so in, in that sense, uh, I describe theology as the interpretation of traditions in relationship to a, to a, a set of, of problems. In, in that sense, uh, I'll baptize the whole group. You're all <laughs> theologians. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, we, and, and we need more of that kind of theology precisely in order to have a good secular discussion of the kind that you're talking about. I, I want to pick up with, with one thing. You know, I'm sitting there very carefully listening, thinking about what you're all speaking and, and where you're intersecting. And actually, Mark, I think, set the stage for us very nicely. What, what you're really discussing up here, as I see it, is what you started to lay out, this intersection between facts and values. Now, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. One of, one of the speakers, I'll specify, it may have been you, equated science with fact. And I don't think about science as a fact. I think about it as a process. It's done in a community. It tries to approach a truth that it also recognizes it'll probably never get exactly right, or it's always open to revision. So, so just that kind of disclaimer, I'm not sure that it, it's a fair game to, to go back to Marx diagrams and think about fact as science. But in a broader perspective, what you all seem to be touching on is how science and values should interact or do interact. And, and what I find particularly striking, this, this conversation in, in the past that I'm, I'm familiar with, um, particularly from some uh, individuals working outside faith traditions, are, are likely to say that um, as science learns more about the world, religions are, are gonna have to come up with a, with a single scientific theology to, to survive. They're going to become, they're gonna look more the same or, or they're gonna disappear, okay? But yet, Mark, you put something up that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that suggested one of the things that comes out of biological evolution is cultural evolution, and one of the things that comes out of that is an expansion and a diversity of values, which then brings me back to this question of secular ethics. Can we, in the, if, if, if that's correct, can we ever do just secular ethics? Because there will be players at the table 
whose values come from somewhere else. So it seems more important to get that plurality of values than worry about whether it's just secular values. And one more point on that, um, Susan, specifically for you, and in relation to what Mark was saying, do, will this super intelligence also evolve culture? And if it evolves culture, will it have values as well? So let me just ask you to kind of think about the, the connection between all of you in terms of this idea about science and fact and values and the intersection between them. If I could real quick, I think I can try a, a practical short response that, that may help a little bit with the future conversation uh, related to what you're saying and, and concerns about secular ethics, because many people are concerned about secular ethics, I think, I think rightly. Um, there is, there might be some experts here in the room actually, there's this field meta law which has taken the golden rule and made it a little bit different. Instead of do unto others as you'd want to be done unto you, it's do unto others as they would have you do unto them. So it's a very sort of simple, straightforward, practical thing where, oh, you just ask. Now that's oversimplifying. But there's a way to begin to understand diversity and how you should react to it. You, you just ask. I'm not saying that's the end of the story, but that's a potential practical starting point for dealing with massive diversity of values. So I want to ask, why are you so concerned about secular ethics? And I want to propose that um, the reason you're so concerned about secular ethics is that there is this belief that you cannot have objective moral laws without a lawgiver, about some divine power that is handing them down. Well, any, even atheists believe that there are objective natural laws, correct? Yeah. So why should we assume that there couldn't be objective moral laws yeah. without a lawgiver? Yeah, and absolutely. so um, the concern about secular ethics, I think, is a concern that without theology, somehow a moral fabric is going to break down. And I believe that you said that our moral vocabulary has shrunken. Well, part of the problem with that is that philosophy Secular ethics is banned from the schools until college because it's considered dangerous. You know, we talk about things like abortion in uh, the uh, classrooms. I've had colleagues who are moral philosophers invited into high schools to talk about, for example, the existence of God. Uh, and they go in and say, well, here's the arguments for the existence of God. Here are the ones against it. And no, stop. And they go in and they talk about abortion and they don't want it. They don't want it in the classroom. Uh, whereas theology is considered much safer to have in the classroom. And so what I'm suggesting here is that part of the problem is that, and I'm going to put it in evolution, maybe we haven't evolved culturally enough to understand that, you know, at one time people believed that the natural laws were God-given. They required, how could you understand natural laws without a God a lawgiver, right? And so all I'm suggesting is that secular ethics is a very, it goes back 2,000 years to the ancient Greeks. Uh, and they talk about the gods only metaphorically. They don't mean it seriously. So there is a long tradition, uh, older than the Christian tradition of secular ethics. And I think Elspeth wanted to say yeah, something. Yeah, I would like to, re to respond. Um, the, there are two parts um, to your question um, that were sort of directed at me. So the, the first is the idea of science as facts. And I would never suggest that we define science as facts. And, and in fact, I agree with you that science is a process. I would say it's a quest to discover facts, to, to come up with facts. And these facts are always falsifiable, right? That's, that's the idea. And, and I would hope you would accept that yeah. sort of clarification, um, that it's, it's a quest to. Um, but it is concerned with uncovering facts. Um, and ideally, they're, they're falsifiable, but ideally, we'd like to view them as truths. We don't know for sure, because they're falsifiable, but we'd like to, like to think that they are. Um, and Carol can speak more on that if, if she wishes. Um, but when it comes to secular ethics, I don't think that there are any particular dangers here. And that's a, that's a very strong statement, particularly. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it doesn't strike me as dangerous. And, and I'm speaking from it um, as a political scientist. In political science and political theory, we need, or at least in general, um, we tend to talk about secular ethics as something we need. And the reason we need it is because of the fact of pluralism, it's a brute fact out there. And how do you get um, 
Protestants and Catholics and Muslims and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus to come to the table and reach some kind of agreement. Well, oh, maybe that, that's they, that's but, easy. You have yeah. an alien come in that they're all opposed go. to. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And and maybe you can't. And secular ethics struggles with this. It's not a panacea, and, and we critique uh, sort of the limitations of secular ethics. But what it does offer is it does offer a point um, where you can hold a particular worldview, whether it's religious or not religious, and still say, for all practical purposes, let's try to reach some kind of agreement or have a conversation where we can speak to each other. And I am not a political theorist that thinks that there should be any exclusions of people with worldviews um, that are not secular from the discussion. I think that they're, they're in a democracy in particular, it's important to include them in the discussion. But will a Catholic and a Hindu reach a consensus about the same worldview um, or about extraterrestrial life if that's the specific standpoint in which they're approaching this? My hypothesis is probably not. But if we can talk about this in a language that allows us to try, I think that's absolutely essential. And I just want to say that the moral vocabulary of philosophers who do moral theory is rich. It's not the same as yours, but it's quite rich and extensive. It, it, and it is, it, incidentally, I guess we, sh we probably should not have an extended discussion of secular versus religious ethics. But it's but, a discussion people rarely have, and yeah, I think yeah. that this is an opportunity yeah. to have it. Well, and, 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 I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to take the verses out. Yeah. I'm happy, to, I'm, I'm happy to continue it if that's what people want. And, and my intention to wasn't to promote one yeah. over the other, yeah. but to draw attention to what Mark was saying, yeah. that this diversity of values in, in his model, this interaction, what intelligence means for the cosmos, isn't going to get, get easier. easier. It's, it's going to get, get more difficult. Right. This is on a panel of kind of like-minded people from kind of a similar culture. And and, and yet there's vast differences of opinion. And, and, and so I, I know there's people out there who want to ask questions. If I could just give you a chance to respond oh, to my question about superintelligence okay. yeah. and, and, and value. And I also wanted to respond to Gus's, um, right. I hope I guy, right. I'm sorry, his important observation um, that was skeptical about AI. So let me do that first and then I'll respond to this. I just have a question for the audience. What's multicolored and is all over your house on Christmas morning, at least if you celebrate Christmas? <laughs> yeah, she got it. I bet some of you didn't. I mean, I sort of, I said something that may have led you, which is, you know, to the extent that you're Christian, but Watson, that won Jeopardy, answered that correctly when it was without any leads, okay? And I think it's important to realize that there's a huge difference between the quality of AI research that was going on at MIT, right? And as much as I like Minsky, and you know, I had an uncle there who was a professor as well, um, you know, that kind of project, that symbol processing project from the 70s, didn't pull, utilize brain research because there wasn't a lot of intriguing brain research at the time that could be used. But I think it's important to realize that other species could, in fact, simply reverse engineer their own brains and generate AI in that manner, and that AI nowadays is making wonderful progress. And in fact, a recent interview with um, computer scientists, like a survey, suggested that most computer scientists today think that AI will be created, that's general purpose AI, not just to, say, playing chess, within the next 100 years. And if other civilizations follow that kind of pattern, I think the important thing to bear in mind is that this is an important possibility that we should pursue, okay? Now, you had asked about culture. Well, it depends on how many super intelligent AIs are on a, in a given uh, region of the universe and whether they form communicating re communicative relations. I mean, it could be that they're solid, some of them are solitary beings. I mean, I really like Carol's 
point about octopi, I believe. And octopuses. It's, I mean, it's, it's really weird. It's octopuses. Though. Oh, is it? Okay, I, I'm yeah, saying that because I've got to get that in my head. <laughs> so, All right. I yeah. looked it up online. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. They look like interesting possible pets. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you can't walk them like dogs. I mean, it's very impressive. Um, and I think that looking at non-human animals to get ideas about how super intelligent AI could be thought of is an important suggestion. Values, well, there are people working right now on values in the context of AI. I mean, what kind of values would you program in? And when super intelligence stems from something we program, if and when, would it retain anything like what we programmed in to begin with? So there are people who are Kantians thinking about Kantian frameworks. There are utilitarians thinking about frameworks based on ideas like the ends justify the means and the greatest good for the greater number. So will superintelligent AI have values? They very, well, they very well might, or maybe they'll be completely value free. I mean, we have to think about the paperclip example, although maybe we can ascribe values in that context, yes. right? Yes. And you can probably ascribe values to them no matter what they do. So I think this is a rich area that deserves further thinking. How about if we open it up? Um, over here, Fran. Oh, you, right, yes. Thanks for an interesting discussion here. There's a lot going on. Um, I have a, a question for Susan and, and maybe uh, a point for Carol as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of neuroscientists who really understand um, how neurons work um, that think that we are never going to see uh, consciousness in terms of the hard problem in, in silicon or anything other than uh, what we would consider to be a carbon-based uh, organism with the excitable membrane. And the excitable membrane uh, is, is there to keep that organism in homeostasis. So you've, you need an organism that requires homeostasis in a ranging environment, a variable environment, and you need uh, an organism that has to uh, achieve that homeostasis by ionic flow through the uh, membrane. And a lot of uh, scientists, like Antonio Damasio just came out with the paper uh, saying that he's thought about silicon-based life and we don't have to really worry about AI having values or consciousness because it's not that it's not in the nature of the material, so that it's really important what you're made of, not, not whether you can compute things, but the nature of being made of meat, <laughs> yeah. you know, is, is really the critical issue here. And I think just to, and I wanted to get your ideas about that, but also I wanted to make a point, what Carol said, we don't need the Vulcan mind meld. And, I, I, and the reason we don't is because we have science. And the science tells us a way to differentiate between different alternative explanations. This neuroscience also tells us that all brains do pretty much the same thing with the same structures and the same material. So unless you want to postulate that the same analogous or even homologous structures in an octopus or a duck are doing something completely different than what they're doing in us, which is not a very parsimonious explanation, then, you know, the fact is, is yeah, we, we kind of know. So I and it's not a criticism. It's no, just no, no, no. I, I actually disagree with you. Okay. Uh, first of all, the octopus brain is very different than our brain. Second in of all, one sense. Se second of all, um, you are um, uh, touching on a very old problem in philosophy, the problem of mind. Right. When we talk about sentience, we're talking about the subjective nature of experience, what it feels like to be an octopus. We don't know whether an octopus, there's anything that it feels like to be an octopus. Uh, and that is, we don't know at what stage in neurophysiology conscious experience emerges. This is a very old problem in philosophy. And um, we just, we know a lot about, you know, uh, neurons and what neurons make uh, you, you know, are engaged in sort of when you speak, uh, when you uh, uh, perceive, but 
in terms of conscious experience, it's very illusory. And we really, this is, this is not just at this stage, we have no idea how to think about, note the subjective nature of experience objectively. Because once you make it objective, you've destroyed the subjectivity. Yeah, so, so I don't think it's just a, yes, no, I don't think that it's all, it all cleared us, you know, whether or not um, what animals have conscious experience and what animals don't. It goes back to, you know, the nature of what we're made of and all other animals on this planet are made of. Uh, what nervous systems do for a living is sentience and processing. Perception. And, perception. Well, perception. And, and so some of us feel that um, there's a good reason to think that if we're all made of the same stuff that on, on that basis that there's a con continuity of psychological uh, experience. But I totally get what Let you're saying. Say, and well, we don't know. We yeah, don't right. know. And one more thing is we humans um, have uh, language. Um, a lot of animals don't. So there are disanalogies uh, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm going to try to keep this really quick. Um, so I'm very curious about the Damasio thing. Um, I look forward to the paper. But I mean, I, when I've looked and looked for good articulations of biological naturalism that point to some physical property of carbon-based systems that silicon can't have. And I haven't been able to find something. And right now, in cognitive science, the leading theories of the nature of consciousness, of the physical basis of consciousness, are in fact computational theories, right? So there's like the information integration theory of consciousness and the global workspace theory. So, and you can look at those in my, I have a, a companion guide to consciousness, the Blackwell Companion to Consciousness, where, you know, I've looked very carefully um, the other thing is, I, sometimes when people raise certain physical features of the brain that they think you can't have in carbon-based systems, I mean in, excuse me, silicon-based systems, they're not thinking broadly enough that, is there anything there that defies mathematical description. I mean, when you look at the level of fundamental physics, it's all mathematics. So for me, it's like, well, is there any in-principle reason why the behavior of neurons can't be programmed into a machine? Because after all, it's all mathematics through and through. That is, to simulate something, you know, all you need to do is really understand the mathematics. And then, of course, there's an important philosophical question of whether you know, artificial creatures, you know, uh, you know, things that are simulated beings or AI life forms could in fact be conscious, you know, and we're sort of back to the philosophy there. But I think that there is some science that we can look at, and I don't find it yet suggestive that biological naturalism is correct. Oh, I can't wait. Thank uh, you very much. Mike, over here. Yes, uh, this is uh, a question for Brother Goy Consolmagno. In the 1990s, uh, Corrado Balducci, who was part of the Curia of the Vatican, a man close to the Pope, John Paul II, went to the television in Italy many times, and he proposed the presence of alien intelligence on Earth. Uh, I had a chance not just to give lectures with him, but to be in his home and talk to him, and uh, I asked if uh, John Paul II accepted this presence on the earth. And he told me, I don't know, but he told everyone around him that when I was in television, he should be stopped from anything he was doing to watch me. <laughs> and that allowed me a big freedom to talk about this subject many other times. Uh, in March 2006, a year after John Paul II died, I asked what was the new position of the Pope, the Benedict XVI. And he said, we don't know yet, but if by November the 30th, the, uh, Jesus Christ is elevated from God of the earth, the God of the universe, is the signal we are expecting. In 2008, uh, uh, Jose Gabriel Funes announced that ETs were our brothers. By, uh, then by 2010, I remember you said about the baptism of the extraterrestrials. The question is, 
what is the new position of the Holy Church and the Holy Father uh, around this subject? I don't ask you your position because you said you were very skeptical and we respect that. But we like to know, many of us like to know what the church thinks about the subject and especially the Pope. Thank you. There is no position. The Pope has no position. Um, I would guess Pope Francis probably doesn't even care. <laughs> that would be my guess from the little I've had interaction with him. More importantly, you know that's going to be in the press. That's, it's now. not going to be in the press tomorrow. <laughs> Spice it up. The, the, the various points that, I mean, we're, we're, we're in a, 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 a can't win situation, precisely, because, you know, when, when Father Funes, who's, you know, my friend and my, my boss, said that to the L'Observatore Romano, it's because people keep asking us the question, because they keep expecting an answer, but there isn't an answer. We don't know. How can you make any dogmatic statement, if I can use the word, how can you pontificate, if I can use the word, <laughs> about an experience that hasn't happened yet? The only thing we can do is to say, we don't know, and then, as a good scientist, let's find out. Okay, so um, I have a question for... Carol and maybe our theologians or anyone else who would like to respond. We've talked a lot about the ethical or moral responsibilities, if there are any, of, of human beings toward other intelligent uh, life that we may, that both on this planet and that we may encounter extraterrestrially. But should we not expect the other intelligent life to have the same sense of moral or ethical responsibilities toward us? Why is this always sort of one way? Um, and, uh, and, and should we be indignant if they don't seem to be having conferences and discussing this about how they should be interacting with us? I mean, uh, any thoughts on that? I, I'm gonna to defer to Elspeth because she told me this question would be asked. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a, a difficult question. The first thing I would like to say in response to that question is that we're asking what our ethical duties or moral duties towards them ought to be, simply because there's so much talk out there about what they might do to us. There's, there's fear, there's questions, there's excitement about maybe, you know, they'll be our salvation, maybe they'll destroy us. So I, I think that there's an important place to think about alien life, whether it's um, much, much more simple than we are, much, or much more complex than we are, to think about what our duties towards it might be in an ethical sense. So that, that would be my first response. Um, my second response would be, I think the agent-patient distinction is useful here. Um, we don't always hold, for instance, um, moral patients, um, which would be the mentally ill or children responsible for everything they do. So if there were an alien that, say, say was um, as intelligent as a leopard, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't hold it responsible for what it did, but we wouldn't want to vivisect it live um, in, in a cruel fashion. Um, and we would have some kind of moral considerations in how we conducted science regarding um, this creature. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a powerful moral agent that's out to get us, well, ethics has a response to that, right? That's the reason we came up with ethics. How do we relate to one another? Well, if somebody has a gun pointed to my head, it's within my um, sort of, at my, the limits of morality for me to respond, to respond hostily um, if I need, need to. So, um, so I think ethics can grapple, grapple with, with these very questions. Bruno was uh, burned at the stake uh, for his heretical views on the plurality of worlds. At that time, John Dewey I was to talk about the move of the Copernican Revolution from the, uh, the closed to the open universe and the, the profoundly unsettling uh, uh, impact morally, philosophically, and theologically for example, the discovery of the new world, different cultures, a moral relativism, skepticism, Montaigne on, and was culminating in Nietzsche with the death of God. 
And I was wondering then, if you extrapolate from that, if we encounter not just different human cultures, but far advanced extraterrestrial civilizations, what are going to be the, what is going to be the impact of our, what used to be the great chain of being from up to the summum bonum God in which anchors our fundamental beliefs and values confronted with a radically different value system, radically different intelligence and civilization. I mean, uh, the prospects are sort of vertiginous. Yeah, can, can I attack that one? Sure. Um, yesterday somebody had, I forget who it was, had a wonderful image of communication from 2,000 years, light years distance, the Romans communicating to us, a one-dimensional communication. Uh, the past is an alien world. And we hear the alien world with our own sensibilities, our own expectations, our own interpretations. Um, your description of the history of Bruno is actually totally fallacious, but it's what everybody believes because it fits in with our modern view of how science and religion interact, our modern view of what those people were like then. The medieval worldview is a whole lot more complicated than that. The revolutions, and the upheaval of the worldview didn't proceed the way that you're suggesting, and yet the world did change, and yet there is a, a, uh, a disruption that occurs. The first thing is it's unpredictable. So trying to prepare for one view or a different view to say that it's gonna be this way or that way is a sure way to get it wrong, <laughs> because whatever it is you predict probably won't be like that. But Instead, you could ask yourself, would we learn a totally new physics? Would we learn that Einstein's laws or that Newton's laws turn out to be false? They are false. I don't think so. But we may have a totally new way of thinking about physics that comes from this encounter. Would we learn a total new, totally new sociology? Would we learn that uh, business laws of supply and demand are different? I don't think so but we may learn new ways about dealing with them or new ways of approaching them that we might not know. That's the fun of the science fiction. The disruption is going to occur. The disruption will occur simply when I encounter somebody who's half my age on a panel who has learned things that I've never had the chance to learn and I'm going to be disrupted, and they're going to be disrupted, and I'll walk away saying, these kids, they didn't learn anything. <laughs> and they're going to walk away saying, ah, one of the, can't wait till these old farts get off the stage. <laughs> it is the way of the world, because I was once the young kid saying that about the old fart, and here I am being the old fart now. The disruption does occur. What I think is really important, what's important to science, is the ability to say, oh, I was wrong. What's important in religion is to be able to say, oh, I was wrong. And when you say I was wrong, it's not because you were wrong in the fundamentals, but because being true to the fundamentals means that you got this particular application. You made a leap that you shouldn't have made. You made a mistake you shouldn't have made. Um, since we're talking about ethics, I want to mention a, a wonderful book on, called the, the Abuse of Casuistry. Now, casuistry was a marvelous enlightenment idea that essentially you could come up with a calculus of ethics. It's dreadful. It failed miserably. But, it, but in the way it failed, it was very instructive about how we can and cannot try to turn ethics into a calculus. There is, uh, to, to go back to an illustration from that book, the author, Stephen Tomlin, describes being on a panel at a hospital where they're going to decide whether or not experiments could be done on uh, people like children, people like the mentally ill. And he was panicked when he saw who else was on the panel because there was every possible religion, every possible background, every possible philosophy. He says, we won't even agree on what room to meet in. In fact, most cases were obvious. No, you can't do that. Yes, you can do that. Everybody agreed at the end, but they all had different explanations for why they agreed. In some ways, that's the way we do physics. 
we see the result and then we go back and say, okay, why did it work that way? And if your view of quantum physics is different from his view of quantum physics, you may come up with different explanations. But we both agree that's what happened. May want to mention. Um, Mark just wanted me to mention that there is a book on ET altruism. <laughs> Who's the author? Uh, Doug Bakach is the editor. It's actually called oh. Extraterrestrial Altruism. It tries to get into a lot of what I think Jennifer was raising. And I think we've given you plenty of things to think about and talk about over lunch. And I see that we're being pulled off now. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.